Hello and welcome everybody. Uh, welcome to the Automation Village uh, breakout sessions for our ongoing virtual trade show series. Uh, this is the first breakout session following up the first virtual trade show, and there'll be another one next month. And the invitation to that, to that will be in the email that you received uh, that brought you here today. So thank you. Thank you for joining us. Thank you for uh, participating in our ongoing experiment on how to, uh, how to work in a world without trade shows. Uh, how do we meet people? How do we build relationships? How do we learn about new products and solutions? Uh, how do we bring together that synergy. I have to put a dollar in a jar now for saying the word synergy. Uh, so this is our way of, uh, of helping to bring the community together and providing a resource uh, to you and also to, uh, to the vendors and to the uh, manufacturers who you'll be talking to today. Uh, so thank you. And first up, we have Roy Koch. Uh, he's the Vice President of Sales and Marketing for Dream Report. And uh, Roy, is, uh, he, for the last 40 years, he's held the management positions with uh, GE Digital, Kepware, ARC Advisory Group, among many others. Uh, Ocean Data, as many of you know, uh, they're the creators of Dream Report software. Uh, they make advanced reporting and dashboarding uh, solutions for the automation industry. And uh, today, Roy is actually going to, uh, after a few slides, uh, he's actually going to demonstrate for us how to create in his software uh, a, a report and a dashboard board uh, using live data from a VT SCADA application. And for some of you who know, uh, this, this is hosted by VT SCADA. So, um, so I will now hand the reins over to Roy Koch. Are you there, Roy? I am. Thank you very much. Let me share my screen. And I will turn off my camera. All right. You should be able to see my first PowerPoint slide. Looking good. <laughs> Thank you for having me. I was happy to be part of your last event. You uh, do such a good job pulling customers in or, or clients in, and it's a pleasure to be able to present again, this time really doing a deep dive into our product, showing you how to work with Dream Report. Thank you, Roy. Just before you begin, I forgot to show a slide that said, uh, now at the bottom center of your screen, those of you watching, there's a QA and a uh, button, and you can use that to, at any time during Roy's presentation, enter in a question. And at the end of the presentation, I will pitch all your questions at Roy, and he will knock them out of the park. Sorry, Roy, carry on. <laughs> no problem at all. Great. So let's tell you a little bit about Dream Report. It, as the name implies, it is a reporting solution, but it's much more than that. It's also a data collection solution, manual data, automated data logging, so we can build histories of information if they don't already exist. And it's a dashboard solution, so we can take any information from virtually any data source, and we can turn it into all kinds of documents, PDF documents, Excel documents, real-time web pages, what we call dashboards. Dream Report has a portal that will host that information. You can bring any kind of information, again, from any data source through hundred, over 100 drivers that Dream Report supports. And we can make it look as pretty or as informational as you would like. We've been doing this for a long time. This is our 15th year anniversary. Dream Report's been through over 25 releases and uh, we have a lot of development in this product. It's been tailored for virtually every vertical market. We'll talk more about vertical markets in a moment. We have 11,000 plus installations all around the globe. Dream Reports translated into 14 languages and it's priced right. It's a scalable product. You can start small and work up with it. Our customers love our product. That's evidenced by our third year winning Engineer's Choice Award, which is the number one award in our industry. And at this point, I can honestly say we're the most recommended and resold reporting or dashboard solution, industrial solution within our industry. The number one area of differentiation for Dream Report is the fact that we developed it for process engineers, for the people who need the information. You no longer have to go to IT professionals or your internal IT group and ask for reports. You don't necessarily have to bring in system integrators to do the work for you. Dream Report is an easy to use tool. You can install it yourself. You can configure it yourself and use it for whatever information you need. The three areas of value that we focus on with Dream Report. Number one would be compliance information. 
So compliance information would be the data you have to you have in order to be in business. In the water and wastewater industry, those are your EPA reports, your monthly operating reports. In the pharmaceutical and biotech space, compliance information would be your batch records, your quality reports that need to be archived, the documents that are required for you to be able to deliver your products to, con to the consumer market. Those are the key to compliance oriented markets that we're in. Uh, wastewater in business takes up about 30% of, of our revenue. Pharmaceutical would be the next largest market. Once you have your compliance information taken care of, the next natural thing to generate would be performance information. That's the information you want in order to run your business better. It's downtime, it's performance, KPI dashboards, it's batch reports, quality reports. Dream Report's very good at that. In the oil and gas industry, we have a great deal of, of cybersecurity built in. It's important for that market. Alarm analytics is very important. Dream Report supports things like ISA 18.2 for all kinds of alarm analytics. Building automation is a big space for us. In Europe, we focus on things like EPBD, European Performance of Buildings Directive. In the US, it's reporting your information for Energy Star Portfolio Manager, comparing your building to others. Whatever the vertical market over the years and over all of our releases, we have tailored Dream Report to perfectly fit the needs. By the way, the third key requirement for Dream Report, besides compliance performance, is the ability to troubleshoot your data. And Dream Report has some very nice tools. We'll, we'll actually create a report for troubleshooting purposes that allows you to select tags, pick dates and times of interest, pan and zoom and export and look at your data however you'd like. So some key points that you'll see in this demonstration is that Dream Report connects directly to VT SCADA. We have purpose-built drivers. Our relationship goes back to 2014, where we developed a relationship, became an endorsed reporting solution for VT SCADA. And we built three types of drivers into Dream Report. The ability to access real-time data from P uh, VT SCADA, the ability to query what's happening right now and include that information in a report or a dashboard. We can query alarm and event data from VT SCADA, and we can query history data. VT SCADA is excellent in generating all kinds of history information and logging it, and Dream Report can expose all of that and give you all kinds of calculations and, and statistics on that data. You'll see that no programming or scripting is required. We'll generate reports, we'll generate dashboards, we have lots of templates. Templates are very handy. In fact, there are over 84 templates in Dream Report. You can copy and paste objects from other reports into your new report and make development much quicker and easier. We have a lot of productivity tools in Dream Report. Productivity tools tend to be for more advanced users, but it's the ability to export information, make global changes using other external tools, import those tools. It's the ability to use search and replace throughout Dream Report so that you can make large scale changes effectively. We have productivity tools. So if you have multiple production lines, we have something called virtual report instances where I can take one report, treat it as a master and create data sets for instances of that report. It's especially important in the pharmaceutical space where validation needs to be done. I'm not going to install Dream Report, but that happens literally in minutes. You can download it off our website. You can install it and you can connect to data in literally seconds. I will show you that. We have great documentation, lots of videos for you to learn from. There are two icons that you'll see on my desktop. That's the Dream Report Studio and the Runtime Management Console. The studio is where you build reports or build dashboards, whatever documents you'd like Dream Report to create for you. The Runtime Management Console is a very nice administrator tool. And that allows you to see your reports. You can manually trigger them and test them if you like. You can start Dream Report, stop Dream Report, reload reports. And again, as any admin tool, this gives you a lot of visibility to the operations of Dream Report. My email is there. If you want to test drive Dream Report, you can go to our website, use the download link. 
and you can download Dream Report. I, if send me an email, I'll send you a 30-day free trial license. So you can do more than our typical demo allows. Our demo runs for 30 minutes at a time and gives you 100 tag capability. Our test license will let you run for a full 30 days, hook it up to your process, generate reports, and when you're happy with it, contact me and, and we'll work out a real license for you. So having said all that, let's really play with the product and have some fun. That's what today is all about. As you can see from my screen, I have VT SCADA Lite loaded. I wanted the ability to just get data. They have a very cool weather application that I downloaded and, and added a little bit to. And we're going to play with some numbers that are generated by this. Um, there are various ways that we can connect to VT SCADA. VT SCADA supports an OPC server. So for real-time connectivity, we can connect to it using an OPC DA interface. Dream Report also supports OPC UA, supports a, a number of other standard interfaces, but more important, Dream Report has purpose-built drivers for VT SCADA. So if I were to open up the Dream Report Studio and open up our demo application, that's what you'll see if you download Dream Report and install it on your own computer. Here we have an area called our list of reports, and we have folders. I can click on various folders and look at batch reports or if i scroll down to reporting object examples here we have lots of examples of the various reporting objects that you see down the right hand side so dream report has 17 objects on the right hand side that's probably the biggest learning curve clicking on each and learning what those various objects do if you want to learn about line charts that's our chart object here this report shows you various uses you can copy and paste anything that you see here into your own new report and that ends up being a major time saving so we have all of these template objects that you can borrow from from our demo system the most important thing in any new application though is to configure your drivers your interfaces to devices and you can see here in our driver list our communication configuration wizard that we have lots of companies listed. If you see products uh, listings here, that's because we've written purpose-built connectivity to their product. If you open the trihedral folder, you'll see that we have VT Skater real-time values, historical values, historical alarms. And I have added those into my list already. We'll use VT Skater real-time. Those are blue tags to represent real-time data. We'll grab some VT SCADA history data as well. If I look at one of the configurations, Dream Report connects to VT SCADA using the ODBC interface that provides both real time or all connectivity for real time alarm and event history data. Simply set it up within your Windows environment, your ODBC manager, and then in Dream Report, you select it. You enter in the proper security for it. You test the connection. It works. You add the list if it's not already there. And within 30 seconds, you've connected data from VT SCADA. The next thing to do is generate reports. So we can go over to a folder. We can specify that we want to do a VT SCADA demo. And say okay i've got a blank screen now we're adding things to the screen we can add a title for instance and this report can be a demo or report oops and of course it's a windows application so you can make things bold you can have whatever fonts you like move it around copy paste if you wanted to show a logo you can drop a logo object on the screen. Objects get names in case I ever need to refer to them with other objects. Here we have a nice VT SCADA logo, put that in the upper corner. Maybe I want the date and time to show up. We have an object for that. So I can specify that I'd like to see the date and time. And Dream Report can show things like the start of operations, end of operations, perhaps we're doing batch reporting. Or if I want to show when the report was generated, I'll say 
report generation time. We have all kinds of formatting since we have um, support for Dream Report all around the world. We can take this little area and drag it down. That becomes a header. If I'd like to see a background on this report, we can select the background image. Let's go to report backgrounds and here we have a nice one. This is something I might want to use over and over again. So we have under report templates, the ability to save a report as a report template. And this now becomes the starting point for any other report that I'd like to create. So if I want to access some information from uh, VT SCADA, let's first drop a little text down. I have three cities set up. Um, I know this is supposed to have a water and wastewater focus, and we'll get to that in a little bit. But we have weather information for currently New Haven. And if I want to show that information, I can drop a single data calculation on the page, give it a name. I want to now browse the current data under statistic functions. Dream Report has all kinds of math that it can do for you. Average, max, mins. We have advanced functions for counters and timers or runtime percent utilization, energy functions, batch functions, statistic process control functions. If we want to access real-time information, that's called a current value connection. And I can browse my data sources. There's my driver connection to VT SCADA. Here I have the tags in VT SCADA. There are lots of tags to choose from in VT SCADA, which is a very nice thing. And I've made a connection. So my data value will appear right here. And let's make that bold and let's make it a little bit bigger. And if I want to do that again, I can highlight those options, uh, those objects, move them over. This one will be named to Boston. I know that is my city too, so instead of browsing, I can simply select it. We'll do it one more time. Holding the control key down, lets me make a copy of my objects. And then I can edit this one. And my last city is Dallas. And that's city number three. All right, we can take these items, align the tops, equally space them. Same thing with these. We'll just align the tops and equally space. And we've developed a little bit of a report here. So let's take a look at that. Let's run our project, save the new report. Dream Report's taking all the demo reports, all of these, about 90 of them in this application, and it's loading them up into a background running service. And now it's complete and it shows us our list of reports. Let's focus on this one application. This is our runtime management console. It tells me what project's running. It shows me all my reports. I can select the new report, VT SCADA demo. I can right click and generate that report. Dream Report's creating it. it. Happens so fast that you don't see a little timer go on. But here we have the values that we just collected from VT SCADA and, and it's a real time connection. So that's the first report instance that we've created. Let's go back here and show you some other features we have in Dream Report. You saw all the tags that are available from Dream Report. Dream Report has a feature called our data models. Data models can be groupings of tags. And if I want to modify one that I've already created, you can see here that I've created a, a data model for the humidity tags and the temperature tags from VT SCADA. If I were to select one of them, there you see the VT SCADA driver and the tag that it's referencing. I also have the ability to rename things. So if I want to go and create a new folder, perhaps I want to get wind speeds. Let's go ahead and, and add to our data model. 
wind speed. I'm going to pick my data sources now. My data source is a VT SCADA history. Here are all the tags we have in VT SCADA, and I can scroll down and get the wind speed value and add it into that folder. Let's do that two more times. So I'll do city two, wind speed, add that to the folder. And then one more time, by the way, you see here, we have the ability to ex export and import these folders. So if you had lots of tags you needed to work with and you wanted to do this outside of Dream Report, you certainly can. Our user interface is very easy to use, but if you wanted to do it more quickly, you can. So in this case, I'm going to rename this to New Haven because it's in New Haven wind speed. This one will be Boston. This one will be Dallas. So this again is an example of being able to create any kind of groupings of tags maybe group only the tags somebody needs for a particular report or a particular interface to make them easier to use. And we'll save that away. Now, if we go look at uh, other objects that we can add, for instance, here we'll add a chart object into our report. And if I want to browse my tags, I can go to my history. I can go directly to the VT SCADA history in which case I would be browsing all of the tags that are available, or I can go to our data model. And our data model shows me just the tags that I want. So we'll add Boston, we'll add Dallas, and we'll add New Haven. So here we're charting the wind speeds, up here we're showing the real-time values, and we can generate this report again. Dream Report asked, do you want to make save, save the new report before you go and run it? The answer was yes. I'm looking at this report now, we'll generate it. We'll open the PDF. And here you can see the wind speeds from the cities as, as well as the instantaneous information. If I wanted to show a table of some information, go back to our report, and drop a table object on the, on the page. And again, I can go to our VT SCADA and browse directly, or I can browse from our data model. And let's take a look at those temperature tags. This is a raw data table. And by the way, down here in bottom of every object is the ability to say how much time you'd like to get. Information can be brought in as fixed periods. Fixed period could be last month, last week, last period of any, any dimension. Uh, it could be current period, so current month, current year. We have batch-based periods. So Dream Report has the ability to understand whether data is um, when, when batches start, when batches stop, and it can run the application or run the reports based on start times and end times. So we will leave that as the default, getting the last day of information. We'll reload the report. Wait for Dream Report to open up the Runtime Management Console. There we go. Select our report, right click, generate, open it up as a PDF, and here you can see the data was logged. There are gaps because this value was logged at this particular time, this value was logged at another particular time. And so far we've been collecting information, real-time information, history information from VT SCADA. Let's also look at some SQL data. Dream Report isn't just an industrial product. We have the ability to pull in all kinds of information. If you're familiar with Northwind, that's a Microsoft database. And Dream Report offers a nice feature called a visual query builder. We 
can put a customer database in here. We can grab an orders database. We can link them together. And I can say, give me the company name, give me the region, give me the order date, give me the ship date. Dream Reports built the SQL for you. And we can now reload reports. Wait for the Runtime Management Console to come up. There it is. Let's go to our report. We'll select it. it. Takes a little longer now that we're going to multiple data sources. We'll open the PDF. And here you can see that we have our real-time data, VT SCADA history data, and we have SQL data coming from a SQL database. When is SQL important? Well, perhaps you have asset management information you'd like to pull out of a SQL database. Maybe you have customer work orders, inventory information. Dream Report can pull information from any data source and combine all of that into one environment. Let's show you now the Dream Report web portal. So we have a quick link to that. It's called the Open Web Portal link. Dream Report automatically builds this web portal, shows you your list of reports, the same one that's in your studio, and you have the ability to expand, and it shows that we have four reports already waiting for us. So we've built this demo report, Dream Report automatically puts it into the portal, and here you can see the last report we generated, the one before that, which doesn't have the SQL data, you can look at the very first report where we just collected the three values at the top. Dream Report lets you execute reports from the portal. So I can say generate a new report right now. And you can see it added a report and it generated another version of that report. Now this report, by default, I left the time settings to pull up the last day of information. Dream Report lets you override that for reports. We call that a new dynamic report. And I can say, I'd like to see the fixed period last one, oh, let's pull up last four hours. And Dream Report just ran that report. And four hours ago was seven o'clock. When we do last, by the way, last refers to completed periods. So the last completed hours were from seven o'clock to 11 o'clock. We're at about 11.27 at the moment. If I were to rerun that report, this time asking for fixed period current four hours, you'll see that we get a report from eight o'clock to where we are right now, which is 11.28.02 when, when this report was run. So we can interact with reports, we can trigger passports. Let's make some changes to our report and make it an interactive report. Let's delete a couple of things here. I'd like to take these items, move them down a little bit. Dream Report has web elements. Web elements are web page interactive objects. So I can add a date and timestamp picker that we'll call start onto the report. When I do that, Dream Report automatically turns this into a web page because these web objects only act within web pages. We'll make a copy of that. And we'll name that copied object end. So I have the ability to pick a start time and an end time. I'd like to see tags. So let's drop a combo box onto the page. We'll call that tags. It will show me a tag list among many other things it could show me. I'll allow multiple selections, but then I'm gonna go to our data model called BTS tags. And that's what's gonna show up in here, but it could be a direct tag list from VT SCADA as well. And finally, let's add a button. That button will be called refresh. And it's gonna refresh report. It'll make a dynamic tag replacement. So it'll get the tags from our combo box called tags. It'll also use the date and time information 
from the object called start and the object called end that I just created. And there we have some objects that will refresh this report using this information for this chart. Let's uh, move this up a little bit. Let's scroll down and add a very nice object that we have, which is called an automatic statistic table. Automatic statistic table can do a number of calculations for you. So if I were to um, select a data source, whoop, let's back up and select a history data source, not a real-time data source. And now I can pick our tags. I'll put one in just so I have something to reference, but we can replace this when Dream Report runs with the tags that are in the combo box. And I can pick things like the maximum, the minimum, the average, if I were looking at flows or flow rates, I could integrate them. If I'm looking at motors, I could be calculating run times and, and uh, number of uh, cycle times. Let's go and change this to average, AVG. And there we have an automatic statistic table. You'll see what that looks like when we run this report. But this report has now been turned into a web page in addition to the PDF format. I said, let's take a look at that again. Uh, reload. It says, do you want to save? I said, yes. We'll open the web portal. And now I can go to our report, which is a web page in addition to being a PDF file. And this web page allows me to go back to any period of time I'm interested in and pick some tags. Let's look at the humidity values for the various cities. Oop, go back here. Go back in time, pick the humidity values, refresh. And there we have two days worth of information. And we have the average max and mins. And if I wanted to pick the temperatures, refresh, we're going getting the history information. There's the temperature information. There are the temperature max mins. So we can make your data very interactive. Notice I, this is still a static object. I can't make any changes here. Well, that doesn't have to be that way. We can close this down. We can go back to our report, double click on our chart, and under appearance, we can make that chart interactive. So you can choose whether or not you want to make that possible for people, and we can reload reports. Wait for the runtime management console to pop up. Take a look at our web portal. We'll grab some information, refresh. Now though, you can notice that we can zoom in, we can highlight data values. Oops. Sorry about that. Clicked a little too much. Grab our data values. Refresh. I have the ability to export this information. So here I can say, let's take the information for Boston, copy it to a CSV file. I have that on my machine. Since this is a web portal, this can be done from any computer on your network. And then you can access your information. So there we've exported the information that I was looking at within that trend chart. These are the actual values from Historian not being interpreted in any way by Dream Report. So that gives you an example of making interactive pages um, being able to generate reports. 
Let's show you a couple of other things. Dream Report has the ability to host external documents. In this case, I created a report that simply has our user manual built into it. If you look in the documentation directory of Dream Report, you'll find a very detailed 600 page user manual with lots of information on how to use Dream Report. By the way, learning Dream Report is quite easy. You can learn Dream Report by going to our website. And here we have our homepage. Dream Report downloads are available here. We have a tab called Video Learning. That brings you to this page where you can see all kinds of how-to videos. And if you click on this YouTube link, here you see a lot of testimonial videos as well as a lot of those how-to videos. Most people learn Dream Report on their own by downloading the product, playing with it, and then watching a number of these videos. Uh, we do have training courses available, and a standard training course would be a, a three-day class. If we go back to the Dream Report web portal, I can show you some other demo reports that we have. For example, here we have a real-time dashboard. So once you create a web page, all you need to do is say refresh that web page and these numbers you'll see will be updating about every five seconds or so. So Dream Report can build real-time web pages, live dashboards, and you can be hosting those on big screen TVs and, and displaying them at the end of production lines as many of our customers do. If you want to generate reports on pump runtime efficiencies, for instance, here we have a report that's showing you when something starts, when it stops, how long it ran, how much it cost. This is a sample report that you would easily be able to build. In fact, it's, it's here and, and you can go into the studio and, and interact with that report. You can trigger that report anew. Now we have four copies of this report and by default it pulls up the last week's worth of data. But if I were to run this report dynamically, I can say, get me absolute information. Let's go back to December of last year. So I wanna run this report for December to January. Hit refresh or generate the report. And here you can see the information for that pump operating all of December. And we have totals at the bottom, number of hours it's run, how much it's cost us. So Dream Report scheduling is done under what we call report settings. So I can right click on the report, go to report settings, and we have file naming conventions. We have report triggers. If I want this report to be generated at eight o'clock every morning, except Saturday and Sunday, I've just modified the time-based schedule for the report. Could be yearly reports, quarterly reports, monthly reports, daily reports. You can report on things every few minutes. We can trigger reports based on event. So enable an event. I can browse my data sources, could be BT SCADA as a data source, I can pick a digital tag or an analog tag, and then I can compare that tag to some condition if it's on or off, or if a tank level goes below 300, I want to trigger a maintenance report. If we're doing alarm reporting, we have the ability to delay our report generation to make sure our alarm messages got stored properly so that we can query them. So I might delay 60 seconds in order to generate my report, including the latest alarm information. Under report file formats, um, our web report is a web page and I can set it up to have auto refresh for background calculations we're doing as well as a refresh period for real-time connections to VT SCADA. So if we're pulling history data, you may not want to refresh that at the same rate refreshing real-time connections. You don't want to overload queries to your historian. So Dream Report has that built in. Dream Report has the ability to email information. Each report, you can set it up with uh, an email system and put in a list of people it should be sent to. Dream Report will create the email, attach the documents and send it. In the body of the email, You in the text area, you can also include uh, 
any kind of text that you want as, as well as dream report function references. So if I want to include data values within the email text, you can set that up. Dream report can print reports. We have support for primary printers as well as backup printers. That's very important in manufacturing environments where you need labels to move pallets and you have to have redundant printers to make sure that the print is or the label is always available. Dream report can store data to Excel files. We do a lot of water and wastewater reporting based on Excel. And I can take the variables from my report, either tables or individual values, and I can map them into whatever cell locations I want. If I'm mapping a table, well, then the entire table will go into the Excel document. You can decide which sheets you want to use and name the sheets, and Dream Report will put the data into specific sheets. We can take templates, and quite often we're given EPA templates to use where Dream Report then fills in the data and then saves it under a new name all automatically. So that's Dream Report logging data to Excel files. Uh, with our latest release, we have the ability to generate XML documents now. So that allows you to transfer information to other systems programmatically. Notice that we have the ability to assign electronic signatures to reports. So by checking that box, the report now requires electronic signatures before it's distributed. That's very powerful functionality that Dream Report has for the um, pharmaceutical and biotech marketplaces. To show you what some of that would look like in some of our other vertical market reports, let's go back to our portal. Let's take a look at a batch reporting example, for instance. So here I can generate a report that shows me the batches that have run over a certain period of time. We can click on a particular batch and do a, a detailed summary of that batch, and that's what's being run right now. So being able to link reports and do drill downs from reports is something that's supported very well with Dream Report. So here's a batch detailed report. It's when the batch started, when the batch ran, how long it took. It's a multi-page report. We're showing the data from the batch. There's a chart from the batch. This report hasn't been signed, but if it were, this signature box would be filled in. And then once it's filled in um, with user information who's allowed to sign off on the document, then the document would be sent on its way to those recipients in the email list or stored in any directories. Dream Report has some very powerful SPC capabilities. Here's a nice example of our SPC charts. And this is very nice automated functionality. We highlight any of the Nelson rules. So here you have two red dots. Those are variables outside of the Nelson rules that are selected to be monitored. We have a very nice set point analysis report. Dream Report is the leading product to do temperature uniformity surveys. That's important for the automotive and the aerospace industry. So generating thermal reports, monitoring ramp and soak profiles and showing you whether those reports have passed or failed is a really important capability of Dream Report. And with that, um, we're coming up to a point where I think it's worthwhile to open it up for questions and answers. And then, Happy to invite Chris back in. Here I am. Chris? Thank you, Roy. That was great. Um, that would, you covered a lot of territory in a very short period of time. I think you've done this before. Is that true, Roy? <laughs> yeah, thankfully, uh, working from home and doing webinars is a, a normal part of my everyday business. Yes, it's interesting. It's now become a normal part of all of our everyday business. It used to be just a few of us were fancy webinar doers, but now, uh, now we all are. Uh, so, yes, we've got a few questions coming in. By the way, I'm going to snatch back uh, control here. Oop. Those were some beautiful looking reports. Uh, so I just want to remind people that if they have any other questions, uh, in the bottom center of their screen, there's a Q&A uh, button. Just click that, enter your, uh, enter your question, and that'll throw it in the queue. Uh, so, so far, uh, I've got someone here who says that they mentioned that they already have uh, some kind of reporting utility built into their SCADA. And of course, VT SCADA users uh, already know that VT SCADA has a built-in reporting utility that's built in, uh, plus the ability to connect to 
to things like Dream Report. What's the value proposition of having a SCADA software that may have some reporting and also uh, having Dream Report? Yeah, very good question. Thanks. So the reporting that's built into VT SCADA is very good for troubleshooting purposes. And I think that's one of its, its primary uses. Dream Report is especially good at much more complicated or more detailed reports, especially reports that are required for regulatory purposes. Right. So generating the monthly operating reports that are necessary for the water and wastewater business, again, is our largest market for Dream Report. And that's an area that we, we do very well in all around the world. Great. So it's the more complex reports, and it's also the ability to have the reports in your format as opposed to the standard formats that are delivered by VT SCADA. Right, and it'd be difficult for a, for a SCADA company to know what the standards are in every market. Right, that's exactly right. That's the business that we're in. And, and the other advantage, you know, VT SCADA is a very powerful tool for what it does. But if you have other databases, if you have other right. pieces of automation equipment, that's where Dream Report with over 100 drivers has the ability to pull in any of your data and provide statistics across all of your data sources. Right. Uh, so the next question is, can Dream Report read from existing Excel files, uh, specifically Excel or from a specific Excel field in an Excel uh, that's a great question, and the answer is yes. So some of the standard drivers that we have in Dream Report, um, we have CSV drivers. I'll get to Excel in a moment, but we have CSV drivers. A lot of products log data, um, panel products, for instance, industrial panel products, often log data to CSV files. And Dream Report has a special driver that will map to those files, automatically import their data, and then report against them. We also have a feature that will go out and automatically collect files for you. We call that our FTP transfer engine. So if I have remote devices across a network, Dream Report can on a schedule collect files, CSV files, Excel files, or any other file for that matter, and then transfer them to a local directory, local to Dream Report, where it will again process them. Dream Report also has an Excel-based driver. So you can pull individual items out of Excel files. You can pull columns of data or rows of data out of Excel files. Our Excel driver maps to an Excel workbook and worksheet and will process the data automatically. It's a very nice way of doing data collection. Sometimes people are walking around with tablets. They can be entering in information into a local Excel file, get back to their desk, drop that file into a directory, and then Dream Report will automatically extract the data and process the file from that directory. So someone was wondering, are you, does Dream Report log the data twice? Like is it uh, when you pull data from, uh, from different databases, including SCADA, uh, are you creating a, a, another database on top of everything else? Awesome question. That highlights a very important feature that Dream Report does not replicate data. So we have the ability to log data if data is not already logged. That often comes in handy if we're doing sample management, if we're doing lo operator logbook data collection. In those cases, Dream Report, as you're entering data into a web form, and we can very easily create manual data entry forms within the Dream Report web portal, um, we would log that data to a relational database of your choice. So we're using an ODBC connection and we commonly would log to things like MySQL or SQL Express or Oracle or, or Microsoft SQL. So it's, it's up to you where you want the database to be held. That is an open database. We don't make any, we don't lock it up. We don't encrypt it in any way. So mm -hmm. you can use that database if you have the, the proper access to it. That's so great. Dream Report doesn't replicate the data. When you generate a report in Dream Report, we go to the source of data, BT SCADA's history files. We request the data, we generate the report, and a week later, if you ask for that information again, we, we reprocess that information and go back, uh, request the data, generate the report again. There are some products on the market that are called report-as-you-run products. 
and those products build up a database that they use for reporting purposes and they do create copies of your data and they also lose the ability to rerun past reports very effectively. Um, also, if their reporting solutions are down for some reason, downtime is always something you have to wrestle with, you ha perhaps have a gap in your reporting functionality where Dream Report, since we can rerun any past reports, we never have those issues. So that was a very important question and a big differentiator for Dream Report. That's great. Um, so here's a basic one. Uh, what are the system requirements to install and run Dream Report? Great one. Dream Report works on every version of Windows that Microsoft currently supports. We always try and stay up with that. That's both workstation and server class operating systems. We're also getting involved in embedded versions of Dream Report where machine builders want to have Dream Report running on a, a single board computer or module computer in a cabinet. And for those applications, we've tested Dream Report on Windows 10 IoT as an embedded operating system. Right. Dream Report works very well with virtual machines. Um, so you could be using VMware or Hyper-V and, and virtualizing your Dream Report install. Excellent. And do you have any canned reports for California water quality? Specifically, they are required to prepare a turbidity uh, event report every month. Do you have a canned report for that? Yes, we do. Not specifically for California, but specifically for the calculations that need to be done. So as we look at all the reports all around the country, their formatting is a little bit different, but the data that they generate is all pretty much common. And we've built template reports, so you'll find them in the universal water wastewater report section of our demo. And there we show you how to do turbidity calculations and look at the number of turbidity excursions and we have the ability to filter out when you're doing backwash filter cycles, for example, or looking at your minimum chlorine residuals, taking sample information and calculating what those minimum chlorine residuals are and generating the appropriate reports or just the monthly reports of, of daily flow information. So very common reports that, that we generate we have all the calculations done in the form of templates and you just copy and paste that into your own report and you're all done. That's great. Now, can Dream Report modify or write to a locked state report in Excel? A locked state report. I, I confess question. I don't know what I, that is, but. I don't either <laughs> actually. So um, I'm assuming that's Dream Report with some, I'm not, not Dream Report Excel with some type of security assigned to it. That is not a target market that we've gone after or something that we've done. However, I can say that Dream Report does have the ability to write information back to your process. So if we needed to take calculations from Dream Report and, and write them back to VT SCADA or write them to a PLC, that's often required for more sophisticated dynamic alarm. Uh, calculations or maybe it's for recipe loading capabilities. Dream Report can uh, read recipe information out of a relational database, generate a recipe report and download a recipe. So we do have the ability to write information. But uh, um, the person who had that question about Excel, uh, I'd like to explore that more. If you give me, send me an email at roy.kok at dreamreport.com, I'd be glad to help you with that. That's great. And uh, sorry, I'm reading and talking at the same time. Wondering if having a VT scale, oh, this is an interesting question. Uh, wondering if having a VT SCADA setup where there is a subordinate project, does that affect the Dream Report configuration in any way? Now, I think what you're referring to when you say a subordinate project is that in version 12, and if I'm not, feel free to throw a follow-up question, but in, in BT SCADA version 12, you can actually have master and subordinate applications. And this is another way, uh, not the new way, it's just another way um, to manage large distributed systems. So you could have a number of freestanding systems and then above them, you could have one or more uh, master applications that can pull data in real time. Again, they're not duplicating uh, logging, they're, they, they're simply a master application that can see down into the tags and objects of the subordinate applications in real time. So I think it would depend if Dream Report was configured to speak to 
or to communicate with a specific application, uh, it would be agnostic to any other connections that they had. My guess is, and I don't know this for sure, and I guess feel free to follow up with me at uh, C-H-R-I-S dot L-I-T-T-L-E at trihedral.com. Um, but I, I'm assuming that if you are, if your connection is to a master application that you would have access in configuration to uh, any of the subordinate uh, information, but that would have been done in the setup of Dream Report. So uh, my guess is whatever you set up, uh, if you connect to an application in Dream Report, uh, it won't be affected uh, if somebody came along and added a, a, a master application above it or a subordinate application below it. Does that make sense, Roy? Yeah, thank you, Chris. Um, honestly, I wouldn't know the answer to that. It, it all depends on how your ODB or VT SCADA ODBC interface works. Yes, so we, think, yeah. we connect to that, and if your applications um, automatically expose their information below that, then, uh, then we would access it. That's right. So, but it, but it wouldn't uh, it wouldn't negatively affect it uh, by default. You, you would, if there were uh, subordinate applications added to that application, you could then configure Dream Report to access those subordinate uh, things. But you yes. wouldn't have to. You wouldn't Correct. have to change anything. Correct. Okay. Uh, doo -doo -doo. So, on a web report, could you set up a custom variable, let's say a station number or a pump number? Uh, a user entry and pass that on to other objects on the report? Thank you. The answer is yes, we can. And in fact, as I showed a combo box with a tag listing directly from VT SCADA or from our data model, right. we could use a higher level tag listing that just shows equipment lists. And, and then behind the scenes, we would bring up the associated tags and pass that on to objects within the web report. Great, and I think we've got four minutes now. Um, just one last question about pricing. How does your pricing work? Thank you. So Dream Report's a pretty scalable product. We have a um, number of tag-oriented versions. So our introductory package is a Dream Report 50 tag version. That means we can query up to 50 tags from a remote, a remote data source, VT SCADA, and then we can generate any number of calculations or number of reports from those 50 tags that we're querying. In the studio, in the lower left area, we keep track of the number of tags you're using within your project. There's a DR50, a 50 tag version. There's a 250 tag version. Those two tend to be our most common purchases. We have a DR1000 tag version. 5,000, 10,000, and unlimited. The entry level price is $1,900 for a DR50. That includes one web cal. So every license we deliver has one web user. That can be anyone logging in, but one person at a time. And Question. then we sell it. Do you have a Do you have a price list open right now? Do you want to Do you want to grab back the screen? Um, no, let me leave. Oh, I don't have one on this machine, but thank you. I'm just going by memory on all this. <laughs> and then we have a, a web two, a web five, a web 10, 25, 50, it goes all the way up to 200 concurrent users. And we have pricing for that. So a web two would be another thousand thirty dollars A web five would, uh, I don't remember that one offhand, but but we uh, we do have a number of, of pricing. Um, a typical purchase would be, for instance, a thousand tag dream report with five users, and that's a little over ten thousand dollars. So you get a lot of value out of that. Unlimited reports. Our rule of thumb is typically ten percent of the tags that you have in your historian might be used for reporting purposes, and that helps you select the right dream report. But again, you can get in inexpensively at $1,900 to try things out. You can expand over time, and we only charge you the difference when it's you're upgrading the product. That's great. Um, thank you, Roy. And by the way, this is not a picture of uh, Roy Koch. Uh, this is Peter Diffley, uh, the, the gentleman behind the Automation Village. Um, but uh, Roy is much better looking. Uh, <laughs> so in the last minute, if people are really excited about what they heard today, uh, how do they get in touch with you? What's the next step? Yeah, perfect. Uh, you can call my cell phone anytime, 617-480-4989.
My email is always available, R-O-Y period K-O-K at dreamreport.com. And if you send me an email or give me a call, I can also provide you with a free 30-day trial license. And I'd love to work with you in any applications you might have. Thank you for including me in this, Chris. Thanks, Roy. Always nice to see you. Looking forward to seeing you at a real brick and mortar trade show sometime soon. Very good. Take care. Okay, you too. Great. Uh, thanks, Roy. Well, well done. Uh, so now, for those of you who uh, have been looking at all three streams and wanted to uh, pick and choose as you go, now's a good time uh, to grab a glass of water, uh, or you can simply close this presentation and join another stream using the link that you got in your Eventbrite invitation. So now's a good time to do that. And... In the meanwhile, I'll just give you a, a look at what's coming up next in the different streams. So right now we're gonna we're going to talk to uh, Dave and Don at Phoenix Contact, but also uh, we'll have Endress and Hauser in the oil and gas stream and uh, and JMK Engineering over in the power side. So uh, like I said, feel free to close this one, hop over to another. Uh, you can't have two going at the same time, or I'm told uh, your computer will literally explode. No, I think I read that wrong. Uh, okay, and so next up, let me pull up my notes. We have got uh, Don Dickinson and Dave Eifert of Phoenix Contact. And uh, we know them from lots of trade shows uh, in the past. Uh, we've always seen their booth across from ours. Uh, Don Dickinson is the Senior Business Development Manager uh, for the water sector. Uh, he's had more than 30 years experience. Actually, I'll let him grab the screen. I think um, whenever That's you're ready, idea. Don. Let you Hopefully I'll, grab the, hopefully I'll grab the right one. <laughs> well done, on the first try, no less. How about that? There we go. There they are. So Don is the handsome fellow on the right. And uh, he's had more than 30 years of experience in sales and marketing and product application experience in the industrial automation and controls world. Don is now serving as the director for the ISA Water and Wastewater Industries Division. And I think he serves uh, on a number of different boards and organizations. Welcome. And Dave Eifert is the industrial manager for the Water Resources Management where he has a wide variety of roles, including management, marketing, sales, and technology. Uh, now, prior to Phoenix Contact, he worked with companies like Johnson Controls and Eaton Corporation. And now Phoenix, as most of you will know, uh, they develop and manufacture industrial technology uh, products that power and protect and connect um, and automate systems uh, around the world. Uh, their products are used in industries like the automotive industry, water wastewater, where we normally see them, uh, machine building, uh, power generation, and oil and gas, as well as lots of others. And today they are going to talk about uh, advanced pump controls with the PLC Next pump controller. And now I'll hand you over to their capable hands. Well, thank you very much, Chris. We greatly appreciate the opportunity to be with everyone here today. And I'm trying to, have I disabled my video yet? We can still see you. We can still see you. Well, I'm trying to, I'm trying to find my <laughs> control panel again. Hold on one moment here as I do that. It's true. It hides things as it thinks you don't need them. It's always fun when... And I'm trying to figure out why it's not showing my nice big... Uh, screen for me to work with on my Zoom control panel. Well, it's always nice to see Don on his birthday anyhow. So oh, my goodness. Real treat. <laughs> While you're looking for that, we can all quietly sing happy birthday to you. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday, Don Dickinson. All right. Hang on a second. I'm going to figure out. How to, I tell you what, uh, I'm going to figure out how to do this here in just a moment. I know there's a quick way to do that. And it's like this. <laughs> That's the old-fashioned way. That's how grandma used to do it. <laughs> oh, well, I love technology. So, again, thank you very much for the opportunity to be here, Chris. We really appreciate the uh, chance to talk about something that we find to be very, very exciting here. You saw our picture earlier, and uh, Dave is our industry manager. I am with uh, the business development role within Phoenix Contact for the water and wastewater sector. So, again, thanks for our audience for being here today. Uh, Dave and I have been involved in the water sector now for quite a number of years, and one of the things that we know is that there's 
really not a more common application I can think of, certainly in our industry, than controlling pumps. You know, normally that's pretty straightforward, turning things on and off. But uh, we've got some new ideas here that we'd like to really share with you today that we think is a very different approach. Talk about how we take pump control into the next generation. Now, pump systems come in all sizes, from single and duplex systems to complete pump stations. And the same is true for pump controllers, which range from a single pump controlled by float to multi-pump systems controlled by microprocessor-based controllers, uh, and which might even offer remote monitoring and control. As I mentioned before, for the most part, pump control is very straightforward. We're turning pumps on and off, maybe controlling the speed of a pump motor, and we're also protecting our pumps and, and monitoring for critical alarms, such as over temperature, to determine if there might be some problems that we have to deal with. As I said, pretty straightforward, although it can become a bit involved when we start looking at larger systems. Today, we'd like to take a look at the next generation of pump control, but to really do that, we need to take a look at where we're going from the big picture. Lots of things are happening in the world of automation. Uh, Dave has been involved with a global uh, initiative within Phoenix Contact around uh, those new markets, which would include things like IIoT. So Dave, why don't you give us an idea of what that involves and why that's so important looking forward? Yeah, thanks, Don. Uh, and again, happy birthday. Oh, thank you. Uh, yeah, this is uh, something that we've been heavily involved in at Phoenix Contact, meaning digitalization or Industry 4.0 or IIoT. Lots of buzzwords. Um, and I've been involved in a global team to, uh, to really understand it. But really what it comes down to, after you get through all the buzzwords, is value creation and figuring out new ways to deliver value to all the stakeholders who are out there vis-a-vis -vis this internet technology that we've got. So really that's kind of the key. And if you go to the next slide, Don, sure. please. Um, before we go looking at the future, um, we'll take a look back at the past, where we've been, where most of us are coming from. So if you look at the left-hand picture, you see that remote signaling has been around for quite a while, way back. Uh, but more recently with the industrial revolution, uh, which could be termed industry 1.0, um, industry 2.0 with the kind of mass production assembly lines and so forth. And then really where we all come in with SCADA and so forth is industry 3.0. When we get PLCs, remote terminal units, some telemetry products like radios, maybe lease lines, things like that. And it's served us well as an industry for the last 30 or 35 years. And most of us have all cut our teeth there and understand it quite well. And most of us feel as though IIoT is more of an evolution than a revolution. And in many ways, that's correct. But it, it is also a revolution. And uh, if you'll hit the next slide, please, Don. First, let's get into a little bit of definition. And uh, the first one is telemetry. We've all probably used that term or heard the term. Really, the key is the Greek roots of it, tele or tele, which means remote, and metron, which means measure. So really that's what it is, it's remote measurement. And that's what we've been doing for a bunch of years, lease lines or you know, cell modems or whatever it is. Um, we're all pretty well familiar with it. And so therefore some of the IIoT underpinnings are pretty much you know, old hat to some of us. Next slide, please. Another term is SCADA, which we all are very, very well familiar with. VT SCADA uses it in the name of their product. Um, and really the differentiator there is it adds control to the remote um, monitoring aspect of it. So those are some quick definitions that I thought were a good way to ground the conversation. And next slide, please. So what's different about IIoT? If we've already been able to do remote telemetry for a bunch of years using available technology dating back to the 70s, what's really the difference? Well. If you've been to a conference on automation in the last 10 years, you've undoubtedly seen a pyramid like the one on the left. Kind of an automation pyramid that's all very well um, understood and very rigid. And everybody knows who plays on what layer. 
and how that architecture is constructed. Uh, there could be firewalls in between each of those layers and um, different conduits and zones for protection and security and so forth. So something all the automation professionals have really kind of almost gotten an intuitive understanding of. Just about the time we all understood it is when the uh, internet of things came about and scrambled everything up. So uh, if you look at the little graph to the right, it shows that there's a whole bunch of different relationships now between the data and the consumers of that data. And what happens in this process is that through the internet and things like IOT, IIOT, there is now the ability for different stakeholders to more readily get a hold of the information that they specifically need to carry out whatever it is that they're, that they're interested in. So that could be some executive somewhere just trying to understand widgets and profits and dollars and cents. It could be a regulatory body trying to figure out if you're in compliance. It could be an operator trying to see if am I, you know, is everything up and running the way it should be. Um, and it could even be somebody maybe in accounting saying, okay, is everything running as efficiently from an energy and cost standpoint as is humanly possible? So it's a, a new way for people to get a hold of the information for the data that they really need <clears throat> in an efficient way. Next slide, please. Hey, Dave, before we leave yep. this slide, I wanted to bring up a point that has really come into the conversation as we evolve our control structures, and that is cybersecurity. So while we're on this slide, it's a good time to remind everyone that going forward, many, many more options for connectivity, but unfortunately, this very structured model for our control system hierarchy, which has been known as the Purdue model, and has served us very, very well for being able to define our layers of defense for uh, cybersecurity. This is gonna be a really big, big challenge going forward. And uh, as you can see from the diagram on the right, there are gonna be so many paths of, of data flow that it will be much, much more of a challenge for us to be able to deal with that. So one of the things that we think about as we talk about new technology, the things about security and how do we ensure that even with all of these various means of, of connections, that we know that we've got a secure uh, process in place. Because one of the key things we talk about is getting more access to data, which is a good thing. We, we saw that earlier in Roy's presentation on Dream Reports about this, in, a very important critical use of data to fulfill uh, compliance uh, and regulatory requirements. Uh, that's a good thing. Putting this data and bringing it in is going to be help us in so many ways, as we'll talk about more with IIoT. But I just want to emphasize that one of the conversations we will have now going forward always will be cybersecurity and something for us to be considering when we select our um, control system components and how we put those pieces together. Excellent point. Yeah, let's give a, a couple of examples of uh, how is it that IIoT really enables value creation. And again, that's really what it's all about. It's not about the buzzwords and the coolest technology and things like that. It's, it's just, those are a means to an end and, th and that end is how do we create some value? out of all this. And um, <clears throat> one example that comes to mind is on the customer service side of the utility is AMR. Well, AMR stood for automatic meter reading and all it really was was a way to get that meter to report back to the utility once a month on the usage of that meter rather than have somebody walk around with a clipboard and take down those readings. So it's kind of a cost savings um, to automate that process. So then with the internet, <clears throat> it enabled something that really was impossible before, and AMR ch changed the AMI, which is Automatic Meter Infrastructure or Information. And for example, now um, it can be read much more frequently, automatically. And that can give you the visibility into things such as a leak. So in the past, if there was a bad leak, you may not have known about it for over a month, whereas now, that could be caught probably in minutes. 
and that can be reported out via text from the utility right to your cell phone and alerts you that, hey, why don't you go check to see if there is in fact a leak and that can be fixed before a lot of water is wasted. And I believe that actually kind of happened to Don when he moved into his new house. Yeah, well, it did, and it wasn't that I had a leak. It was just that there was some inaccurate reporting in the initial setup. But yeah, I got a big scare at first, but they were able to, it was amazing. The, uh, the city gave me a call on my first bill and said, we got something going on here and we need to take a look at it. So it was only because they had access to the data that they realized something wasn't right. Turns out it was a pretty simple uh, fix to get that corrected. But initially it was kind of scary because apparently I'd been using tens of thousands of gallons, which wasn't the case. But it was that access to data that allows someone to look in and look at your particular uh, profile and know that something's not right and alerted me to that fact. Yeah, so in other words, this, this new IIoT enabled AMI system enabled some value that could never have been brought to the consumer in the past. And likewise with SCADA, um, that's what the expectation is becoming today too. So in the past we would do SCADA, we'd get decent tabs on our system from an operational standpoint, uh, perhaps from a compliance standpoint, and it was certainly up to the task for all the purposes that were intended. However, now there are more and more stakeholders out there that may want to take advantage of information that could be generated and can now be harnessed. So some of the things people are looking for today is how can I make my system future-proof? Um, I want to get back access to the data that's being generated from anywhere and to multiple stakeholders. How's that going to be possible? Um, I don't just want to run my plan. I also want to optimize it. You know, whether it's the process optimization or do asset management, be able to do predictive maintenance just exactly when needed and not unnecessarily too often or not in a reactive way after things have already broken. And finally, you know, energy is one of the key component costs in delivering clean water or in cleaning up uh, our dirty water. So how is it that we can lower one of our largest costs and that's through energy efficiency. So these are some of the types of drivers that people are looking to get a handle on now in the modern utility. And the platform, the thing, and the internet of things, the thing that's out there needs to be capable of doing more than just its primary function, turning on and off a pump. It's got to be able to assist in some of these other important value creating endeavors. And if you flip to the next slide, Don, please. Uh, so underpinning this pump controller that Don will get into detail on in a minute is a new uh, automation platform that we've come out with. And it's really built from the ground up to be an IIoT type of a device. And if you look at the graphic there of the little product, there's a bunch of people standing around it or sitting around it, programming it. And one's doing it with a traditional IEC 61131 programming package like any PLC might've used in the past with like ladder logic or function block diagram. But there's also somebody using Microsoft Visual Studio, somebody using MATLAB, Simulink, uh, Eclipse, C+, Java, uh, on and on. So it, it can serve the needs of different constituencies in terms of how you program it, but also the stakeholders who get the information that comes out of that. So as you can see at the very top, there's a little cloud symbol, and that is labeled Profi Cloud, which is, which is our little cloud, but it can also be attached to Azure and Google and uh, Amazon and so forth. So it's really built from the ground up to support a lot of these needs that are coming about uh, with the expectations of the industry. Yes, there's definitely some, some cool things. Uh, I've heard people using the terms revolutionary. Uh, I, I don't think that's an understatement. This is a really different approach to a classic uh, controller and giving us lots of capabilities. In fact, not just about how we program it, but they things like the, the protocols of the future, the ones that are still emerging, it's, it's not just how you program it or what you put into its memory, it's also how do you communicate and, and move data to, uh, to the cloud, for instance. Absolutely. Absolutely, and it just doesn't have to be a cloud. I mean, obviously, um, people like BT SCADA are experts in the protocols that they've worked with for a number of years, uh, from simple things like Modbus to more SCADA appropriate protocols like DNP3, which they've also supported for a number of years, to emerging protocols like MQTT. So 
And that all goes back into the discussion, how do you best use the bandwidth available to you and how do you take advantage of the security standards that are built into some of these protocols and get the proper communications to the right place in the right way. So what I'm hearing is we've got us a great platform that future proofs whatever we might want to do, especially in the area of being a pump controller, correct? Bingo. All right. Well, in fact, maybe it's a good idea to get back to the conversation about pump control specifically. And to do that, I wanted to have a conversation about what's out there in the marketplace today. And there's really two ends of that spectrum. There are the dedicated purpose controllers and there are general purpose devices like PLCs that people use to program to do that. So let's take a look at some of the key attributes for each of those. So you see now that there are several that I've listed for dedicated purpose controllers. And I, I think everyone's familiar with the wide range of stuff that's out there. But what we know about most pump controllers that are on the marketplace today, they're pretty much optimized for the application, which means that from a form factor, from a function set, from a price perspective, and even though that price point may vary tremendously from very simple relay-based kind of uh, controls to microprocessor-based controls, the, the point is, is that you know what you're getting uh, and dependent upon your budget and the uh, requirements for uh, functionality. That functionality is defined for each one of these products that are in the marketplace, and that's good because now you know exactly what you're going to get. It's going to go into a car lot and picking a particular trim package, going, hey, do I want uh, the Ford F-150, you know, King Ranch, or am I going with, uh, you know, with uh, something much more economical, for instance? The point is you know what you're going to get for whatever you're spending your money on. And as a result, that makes it very easy for, let's say, a consulting engineer to specify and also for the user to be able to purchase that. If it's going to be supported, it's supported by the manufacturer, so you know what you're going to get there. The downside of a dedicated purpose controller is that you would generally have a very limited range of options, if any, for the type of mix and the inputs and outputs that are available, your communications um, capability, and also a desire to be able to uh, customize that in some particular way. As a result of your limitations on some of the communications and connectivity options, it may be uh, difficult or impossible to integrate that into your SCADA system. Uh, and then usually it's a fixed design, which means that you really don't have any options for upgrading. You know, you buy it, you put it in, it works for, you know, however many number of years. But when it gets to the end of life, you're either kind of stuck in the rip and replace, probably not much chance or an opportunity there for some type of migration into that year of technology. So that's a quick look at kind of the attributes of a dedicated purpose controller. Let's go to the other end of the spectrum and take a look at what we've been doing for many years with using general purpose devices such as a PLC. So what we know about PLCs, as Dave mentioned earlier, that first Monocon PLC coming into the marketplace in the late 60s. So PLCs have been around for decades. They have evolved tremendously and they are readily available from numerous manufacturers. We have a very wide range of choices for the hardware mix and what goes around that as an example. And that's a very important, especially when we talk again about communications and integrating that into a particular con uh, control application. Now the PLCs are not optimized for any particular application, but can be programmed to meet a particular needs such as pump control. And one of the good things about using a PLC for control is that you can do a lot more than pump control. You can control peripheral uh, functions or processes, or in fact, you could run your complete pump station using one uh, controller if that's what you wanted to do. However, there are some challenges on uh, this side of the spectrum, and that is if you're going to be programming a PLC, that usually requires uh, knowledge that is unique to the vendor's platform. And that can vary even from one vendor's platform to the next. Now, uh, as Dave mentioned earlier, there is a standard programming environment, the IEC, IEC 61131, 
which has brought some consistency to the programming environment for a wide range of PLCs that are on the marketplace. In fact, our PLC Next, one of the basic things you can do is use 61131 for programming it. Uh, but still, even when you get into any manufacturer's specific environment, there are things that you have to know about their hardware and about their ecosystem. Usually that program is being performed by a third party, so that's not the manufacturer doing that. Again, there's not a problem with that because there are many very skilled, highly skilled uh, programmers that are out there working for system integrators who are very familiar with both the um, vendor's platform, but maybe also uh, for application requirements as well there too. However, it does kind of create some problems when you have a third party handling of the programming for that. And that is, you know, asking the question, are you really getting what you think that you're getting? If someone's writing a custom program for you, do you really know how that works and what you're getting? And is that really the most cost effective way to get this process done? Another point here is if you are a specifying engineer, how do you specify a custom program? Uh, or if someone's writing a custom program that say, they say will meet your specifications, will they really do that? So that's a big concern there if you're someone who specifies pump controls. Another big question comes around support. So can anyone support the work that's being done by this third party or in some cases I've seen where you actually get locked into the third party. And so even if the hardware is off the shelf, you're kind of stuck with somebody who's done a lot of custom work for you that you don't know uh, how that's being done and no one else can really get into that. And then there's a question about what happens when that PLC platform reaches its end of life and you have to migrate into a newer one. Is that gonna move smoothly? Uh, maybe, maybe not. However, uh, I will say that in general, for most of the PLC platforms that are, that are out there in the marketplace, um, they are generally options there for migrating to newer platforms at end of life. However, uh, there are no guarantees there. And sometimes the only migration path is into that same vendor's um, uh, ecosystem. So that may or may not be what you want to be able to do. So let me try to kind of wrap up this, this particular point of the conversation by saying that whether you are dealing with dedicated purpose controllers or general purpose controllers with a custom program, there are some real limitations to each approach. And so Dave, I guess maybe the question here is, you know, is there uh, a sweet spot that we can reach in that conversation? I'm going to guess yes, there is. And, and what, what would that sweet spot look like? I think it would look like a green cloud. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no. So what we strive to do with this pump controller is to use um, the PLC approach, but to take the standard off-the-shelf PLC, and uh, one that happens to be I IoT ready, and pre-program it so that the user or the integrator can simply just do some drop-down menu configuration to get it up and running, much as they would with a dedicated uh, purpose pump controller, but then it still retains the ability to be further programmed if necessary or if desired uh, to do some ancillary things. So yes, it's going to control the pumps, but it's also going to communicate that. It's also perhaps going to be used to do uh, other functions like control the rest of the, the plant. Um, you know, it could be hooked up through a sensor to the door for an intrusion alarm and those common types of things that a PLC could also do. So we're trying to give the most, best of both worlds with, uh, you know, it's as easy as taking it out of the box and configuring it and you're up and running with your pumps. But if you want to do more, then with the aid of a local integrator or a very savvy technician at the plant, um, sure, go ahead and program it. And oh, by the way, if that savvy programmer happens to be somebody right out of college doing JavaScript, yes, that works too. It doesn't have to be the uh, old ladder logic. Well, I guess we're seeing what that looks like then. So uh, in case you haven't guessed it, we're talking about our PLC Next pump controller. And we're just calling that our PPC for the, uh, for the meantime. 
So that's what uh, our PLC Next system would look like and, and the way that we've configured it for doing a, a quadplex pump controller. So let's talk about some of the details there. Uh, Dave, maybe you want to lead us through this, exactly what that, that uh, PPC looks like. Yeah, certainly. Um, so as mentioned, full featured quadplex pump controller uh, with no programming, just basic configuration, which again is uh, all GUI based. Uh, and it can, it can be customized per your customer's uh, specific requirements. Um, what makes it easy to configure is it's got an embedded HTML5 visualization, which means it's just got a, a simple little web page on there to allow you to configure it. And uh, that can be done via a, if you had like a Wi-Fi access point in that panel, you could use like a tablet to do that. Or more commonly, somebody's just gonna hook up a uh, HTML5 compliant uh, operator interface to one of the two ethernet ports on a device and you know program it through that uh, or you can plug a laptop in and do, do it the same way so uh, that's all easy to do and um Dave, Dave, let me kind of at this point here too I, I noted on here that this was kind of optimized for a seven inch web panel yeah and of course we offer web panels and that's what i was referring to the really nice thing about html5 uh, graphics is that they scale up. So if you wanted to use a much larger um, uh, operator interface panel, then you could do that. And again, the graphics scale very nicely. They will scale down, but we found that if you went to one of the smaller panels, you really lose some um, some uh, some ease of use there. So uh, we said seven inch is a great one, but uh, the the key thing there is that with the built-in HTML5 compliant um, uh, capabilities. It can work with any device that uh, will support that. Correct. And um, we consider it the sweet spot between the proprietary offerings and the generic PLC. So as done, as you say, you know, it is spec friendly because you know what you're getting as a pump controller. <clears throat> and um, since it is built on this Linux backbone that underpins the PLC Next, it is future proof. And uh, we can talk a little bit more about that later after Don gets through the, uh, the features. Oh, yeah. And, and actually, this one last item here, I just want to mention that, again, it is an application-specific solution, but it's using off-the-shelf components. So just a really nice um, approach to doing pump control or actually anyone there. But let's take a real, real quick look here as we want to kind of mention some of the, the comparison points between dedicated purpose, general purpose, and our PLC Next pump controller. As we mentioned, um, I, I kind of use the, the, the pluses and minus and then the quantities of those to kind of indicate something. So we know that uh, from a um, uh, ease of specification and purchase and application, uh, dedicated purpose controllers definitely excel there. That's what they're kind of intended to do but our PPC does that pretty well uh, and also. Uh, readily available, same thing true here uh, with that, with the general purpose stuff being a little limited because you, someone's gotta get that hardware and program it and do something with it. The fact that ours is configuration only, no programming, but the ability to expand that program really gives us two pluses over there in that line. And then this, this is a key one here, flexibility in your IO mix, communications, the Opera inter interface, um, so many key things there that do very well for the general purpose devices, but we do very, very well on our PLC Next platform. Ease of integration into your SCADA system and ultimately into cloud services. We know these things are coming if they're not already here. So I gave us four pluses on that because that's really a place for us to excel ease of customization and some value add by either Phoenix Contact or one of our solution providers. That This platform just gives us so many options there. And the fact that it is kind of non-proprietary in the sense that uh, this is an open architecture platform gives us lots of options if we ever need to migrate this technology in the future. Finally, IIoT ready. It means we're ready for all the future protocols, and we'll explain a little bit how that works in just a bit. This last point I would bring up here, I'm just going to touch base on this for right now, but within Phoenix Contact, we have an incredible program called, known as Cabinet Confidence 
which we provide a limited lifetime warranty for our products when they are powered by our power supplies and protected by uh, our surge protection. So one of the things that uh, we would be able to uh, talk about on our pump controller is this limited lifetime warranty. I, I tell you, that is something right there that is so unique in the industry, not just for a pump controller, but for all of our products from Phoenix Contact. Really something that uh, makes us stand out, I think, and really is a real vote of confidence as to uh, our platforms and what we can do there. All right, so that was a quick look at really, again, why that sweet spot we think we fill very nicely. Let's take a couple look at the key components here. Dave, maybe just lead us quickly through a couple of key points here on the hardware side of things. Sure. Um, the gray box at the left is the controller itself. Um, you see little SD cards sitting there next to it, and that is essentially what the programming is loaded on. So just insert that underneath that cover, and it, it downloads the program which is already written and enables the customer to simply get into the configuration menus and do some simple configuration steps and it's up and running. And then to the right are a couple of different sized HTML5 web panels that um, are shown as being optional. And that's the case because like I mentioned before, if you wanted to set this up with a laptop or some other device, the HTML5 is hosted on the PLC itself and it just needs to target something with a browser. So that could be a panel like you see here or a laptop or a um, tablet. So it is kind of optional. I think most people would want to have a panel there full time so they can get in and troubleshoot and uh, start and stop the thing at their will without having to have a, an iPad with them, but certainly it could be done the other way. So those are some of the key components right there. And of course, what you don't see there is the IO, but the IO was shown earlier and we've got the right IO mix for the situation. All right, great Dave. And of course, really the, the heart of the pump controller is the intelligence that's put onto the SD card. So the point we just want to keep reiterating and that is this is all hardware that's just coming off the shelf. There's nothing special about this. This could have been used for any purpose. We're just taking the hardware, but the real uh, heart of the pump controller is the SD card because that's where everything um, is stored on as from a program perspective and configuration files as you set those up. And uh, what makes this really nice is that from a platform perspective, the ability to upgrade programs. Um, as we said, you get down the road uh, two or three years after you install your pump controller, there's always going to be changes to that. Those kinds of changes can be made uh, remotely put onto the SD card. Those can be just dropped right in. Um, it's an excellent uh, option when you start thinking about things like emergency response plans, disaster recoveries. You know that you could have hardware sitting there ready to go as a backup, but you've got a, uh, a, a tested and fully um, a configured program on the SD card waiting to drop in at any time. Really a great way to do upgrades and again for a quick response in case that should be needed. All right, so let's talk about some of the screens that we talked about earlier. We do have not only the, um, the capability of the interface embedded in uh, HTML5 uh, coding, but we've already pre-configured a bunch of these screens for you. And I'm just going to show you just a couple of these as we go through here, just to give you an idea of visually how things will appear. This would be your main screen. This could be places that you would log in to start um, configuring your station. How many pumps do you have? What are the settings for each uh, stage for your pump system? Is it a pump up, pump down? Do you want to do some flow calculations? Uh, do you want to do some simulation? That's a really key part of this program is that it allows you to simulate um, the system so that as you're troubleshooting, as you're installing and commissioning this, you have the way to fully kind of go through the whole program and make sure it's operating properly before you put that online. And of course, alarm uh, capabilities as well and uh, event logs. A lot of things that uh, you would expect to see in any kind of full feature pump controller. Hopefully that gives you an idea of some of the key things that we've got there. Yeah, and if I may interject, you see uh, a lot of those are kind of pretty little screens. They look pretty presentable and so forth. 
But again, it's an opportunity of synergy between VT SCADA and our device here, because our device is only showing you the data for that specific device. And um, although this could be transmitted over a network, a uh, wide area network or so forth, you could pull this up from some remote location. That's all well and good, but I don't think most people are gonna wanna go through and, and put in the IP addresses of a whole bunch of different things independently when they could simply go to VT SCADA and have a, a complete uh, network layout and simply click on the various stations. So just like uh, with Dream Report, um, working seamlessly with VT SCADA, I think this is a good hand in glove example of, yeah, we got some really nice little graphics, but they serve their purpose, which is basically to configure and get a tabs on your local station. But if you wanna get a system overview, that's where VT SCADA shines and allows you to get that total system at a glance type of a, a overview, which is so important to an operator. Well, and to do that, Dave, we'd have to have a communications interface. So another nice thing I like about our approach with our uh, PLC Next Pump Controller, it does not contain a communications interface. It certainly has uh, dual Ethernet ports there for you to connect to any type of device that you want. So one port could be going to your local operator panel there, uh, web panel for configuration and for operation. The other one could be fed off to some type of communications interface. And Dave, we've got a pretty wide range of options available there too, correct? Absolutely. So kind of what you're looking at here is a lineup for whatever you'd kind of need to communicate locally via Ethernet. Um, so on the far left is a, a modem, a 4G modem, Verizon, AT&T. Uh, the next one in is kind of like the same thing, only much more on steroids and with some real heavy duty security uh, firewalling and routing um, built into it in addition to VPN uh, tunneling built into it. And then we got a couple of ethernet switches in the middle there to the right and uh, managed or unmanaged. And in the far right is a Wi-Fi access point. So regardless of which way you're trying to communicate with the pump controller, there's a good option there. And again, as Don mentioned earlier, if that were included in the panel and our power supply was powering all this, and we had a surge protector on there from Phoenix Contact and all of the above would be a limited lifetime warranty eligible. So that's a really nice side benefit. Yeah, so the nice thing is whether you have your own existing communications interface, maybe using a particular manufacturer's cellular modem, um, or maybe you're hardwired in. Uh, either way, we give you lots of options for connectivity because we know that's going to be one of the driving requirements going forward in the world of I IoT, that is moving data. And so we give you all those different options there. And one of the ways that that data does get used very commonly is if uh, someone is remote and want to be able to check on the status of their station, being able to just remote right into your station and just monitor what's going on, take a look at uh, alarm logs, that type of thing, really a great capability to have for remote monitoring. And the fact that really all it requires is just a device allows you to uh, hit the IP address of that device. So just some really great options. So Dave, I would say we've got a really great solution. Our PLC Next platform is, of course, just solid, built for the future. And now that we've integrated in this particular program for pump control, I think that's a, a really great solid solution that uh, really is the best of both worlds when it comes to selecting pump control. But let's take a look a little bit into the, uh, into the future, what's coming next year. So Dave, I kind of threw up um, a slide here to remind us that the PLC Next platform continues to evolve as well, correct? Correct. Yeah, so it came out a couple of years ago in Germany, and uh, we released it here in the U.S. this year, meaning the PLC Next platform. The uh, reason we did that is we wanted to make sure we had the connectivity to the higher level languages and the Linux side figured out so that we could really tout the whole IIoT aspect of it, and not just the old fashioned uh, IEC 61131 PLC functionality. So that's all here now today. And um, if you want to right. switch the page, this is um, looking ahead. Uh, one of the key things here is, as that graphic comes up, the PLC Next Store. So this is like the uh, Apple App Store or Google Play Store where applications or programs will be housed in this PLC Next store. And what's really cool about it is it's not 
active yet today, but it will be shortly where it will become a two-way uh, store, meaning that if you are an enterprising programmer out there and you're using this platform, you come up with a really good idea. Let's just say it's for energy optimization, as an example. Let's say you're a real expert with pumps and you decide that you want to um, share your knowledge with the world. Well, you can, you can actually host that up on the PLC Next Store with a price tag, which you will be able to split in the revenues of that function block library that you've created with the rest of the world. So uh, again, that's not here quite yet today. The store is in place, but the ability for people to host stuff up there is not quite there yet today, but that's coming. So that's kind of a novel approach to kind of crowdsource best practices and to actually, um, as an enterprising programmer out there, even perhaps be able to benefit from the from, from it monetarily. So kind of new, different way of doing things. Um, but again, until that time is here, it's still a traditional TLC, except that it does have the Linux and you can program it in different languages too. Well, Dave, let me just give you an example here of some of the things you might find at the PLC next door already. Uh, things like pump control. Now, it's, these are apps you can download that is not covering all the things that we've been talking about here today. But a lot of times that's something that someone needs is just a simple um, pump control function without all the, the niceties that we build into what we call the PPC. But um, as an example, Dave, uh, for instance, like protocols. So if someone says, I need an Ethernet IP, um, I need my, my controller to talk this particular protocol. Now it's just a download from the, um, from the store, right? To that's have that great. functionality. Yep, and that's why it's, it's nice to, that's why we call it future-proof, that you can uh, start off with the base level functionality today and as we are able, and as the community out there is able to add more content, it becomes um, ever refreshing type of a platform. So that's the way uh, the general world's going. Everybody with an iPhone or other smart device like that knows that um, they get a lot of added functionality over time with every new release. So that's what we're aiming to do with this as well. Of course, in our world, we all know that it's gotta be extremely tried and true and completely tested and vetted before we keep coming out with new things. So that's always top of mind, but that's, that's where we're headed with this platform. Well, the point is just so many capabilities currently, but more importantly, where we're going down the road. And today, uh, that SD card might just hold something for a pump control. Uh, tomorrow, it could be a totally different function based on what it is you want your uh, hardware to do. So the hardware really just becomes nothing more than the uh, means of enabling some particular function or application to be addressed. It can be changed, altered. You can add functions to that. And uh, just as an example, uh, oh, I want a, a particular data logging function. Um, I want to do some type of loop control or something that's different or unique. Again, that's just a download from the uh, store. That just the flexibility there, I, I think, is unparalleled. It, it really is the next generation of PLCs. It's the next generation of pump controls when you're using PLC Next as the platform. So lots of lots of great options there. Well, I think we're coming up on the time when we want to start heading into our Q and A. If I'm not mistaken, Chris. You are not mistaken. Uh, thank you both. That was very well done. Again, you've covered a, a lot of material there. It's a really interesting piece of the puzzle, bridging sort of current paradigms and, and future paradigms and uh, staying future compatible. I think that was, uh, that was really interesting. Um, just looking through our questions here. Also, oh, thank you for putting it into the context of, 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 a, of a SCADA system. That was, that was really interesting. Um, now, you mentioned that it's easy to do remote monitoring. Uh, can I do remote control of a pump station? Well, as of right now, no, that's not something that we put into the program to allow that to happen. And there's a good reason for that. There's a lot of concerns about someone being able to uh, get into your system and do something. So remote monitoring is easy to do. However, here's where the caveat comes in. Everything we've said previously to this, and that says the ability to customize that. So there's absolutely nothing there that would prevent you from doing that if that's what you want to do, but it's not something that's off the shelf. This is where we highly recommend the involvement of a system integrator. 
because right. we know that, uh, well, for instance, our, the BT SCADA integrators that we work with all the time, they're going to be involved in a whole lot of conversations. And one of the ones that I brought up earlier was the conversation about cybersecurity. I mean, this is going to be critical going forward for um, uh, important critical machines functions. And you're going to be having that conversation with, uh, with an integrator. It's the integrator who is going to be able to um, handle things like the communications interface. What does that look like? Am I setting up some type of wireless system? You, know, you want someone there who's working with you to make sure that all those things are covered. I mean, that's beyond what we would do as a manufacturer, but that's why we need those types of partners in that conversation. Now, that way, I, I got I, more to add to that particular answer, though. <laughs> Please. Uh, and because, and, and um, I don't know if Dave mentioned it earlier, but really when we talk about PLC Next, what that really is, is a platform for collaboration. Now, the pump control program that we've got embedded on the uh, SD card, that's something that we've done. We've done all the heavy lifting for doing that particular function. But we know that every time you do something like a pump control or any type of a control system, there's more things that we want to do. So via uh, system integrators, we have a way for them to add value to the programs out of that. So let's say that someone needs uh, to add uh, a, a, a control of a process for, let's say, chemical dosing. Uh, a, an integrator or a solution provider that we're working with could go in and add that to the program. Uh, you might want someone to customize the screens for you. So instead of saying Phoenix Contact uh, on the uh, faceplate, maybe it's something like Third Street Pump Station for some municipality. So the reason I'm so excited about the PLC Next platform and what it gives us is this ability to work with these solution providers, system integrators, who are going to be handling a whole lot of other functions around that system, but at the same time can really help to customize that specifically for a particular customer's need. And that's why, that's why I think this is really a very unique approach where we want to really embrace those integrators. And uh, we know they're a valuable part of that, a very valuable part of the conversation. They provide a valuable service to the end user, and we want to make sure we get the very most out of that relationship as possible. That's great. Now that dovetails with uh, with another question that we had, which is from the point of view of one of those partner, one of those integrators who would hopefully be partnering with you in this process. Uh, this integrator asks, uh, one of the issues concerning uh, this with the IIoT is that customers are skeptical of uh, of IIoT data security. What would you say to one of these integrators? that they could then say to their prospective end users to, to, um, to relieve their concerns about that. Um, if I may jump in and then Don, you come up and clean up uh, and, and add, uh, and complete my thought for me. <laughs> but I, I would say that, you know, it, it is a basic PLC also. Okay. Mm -hmm. So if you're going to be premises based, if you have VT SCADA on your PC at your plant, and you have hardwired back to that control center or maybe traditional you know, ethernet radios back uh, on your own system, then you're never going over public infrastructure. You're never going over the internet. Um, you don't have to do anything IIoT related if you don't want to. You could do Modbus over that connection if you so desired. Um, you could do DNP3 over that connection if you so desired and never touch public infrastructure. If, however, the end user becomes comfortable with the idea of clouds or, you know, IIoT specific protocols, publisher, subscriber type of things, MQTT, um, then yes, it's all sitting there waiting to be tapped into. But until the end user is comfortable, they can go back with the tried and true way that they've done things for years. So that's one of the key facets that I see as being a bridge between now and the future is that you don't have to wait to become comfortable with something, you can use it today in a way in which you are familiar and then um, know with the best assured that it is future proof that when everybody says, you know what, it's actually better to go to MQTT in this particular circumstance and use uh, a cell modem, 5G, when, when the time comes, it's ready to do that. So that's how I'd answer the question. 
That's a great point. Oh, so, go ahead. And I, let me add to that. Uh, that is a such a valid concern. In fact, in 2018, Congress passed America's Water Infrastructure Act, uh, what we also called OWEA. OWEA puts a big emphasis on resilience, and for the first time, drinking water utilities have requirements per this, this act, regulatory requirements, which include things like cybersecurity. This is gonna be a very important conversation going forward. I, I think the best way to say this for our pump controller is that we've got everything built into it, uh, along with peripheral devices like our MGuard, our security appliance, um, and, and other devices that says whatever security plan you want to put in place, we'll give you the components to do that. But there is so much conversation going on in the industry right now around the WIA that uh, that's going to drive a lot of conversation. And that's why I say you really need the system integrator, you need manufacturers, you need consulting engineers, uh, all uh, having a conversation about what are the standards that we're going to be using, uh, what are the requirements of things like a WIA, that, that we have to adhere to. And it's not just for your pump controller, it's for every aspect of your control system. So it's a great question because it is an important topic and that's why we want to involve as many people in that conversation as possible. But we give you the tools so that whatever you decide on, you can make that work with our device. That's great. And uh, now you've mentioned uh, through the, throughout your presentation that, uh, that this technology works with VT SCADA. Thanks for that. Uh, now they're wondering uh, what other HMIs, I'd like to say none other, that's it, just us. Uh, but of course, uh, you, uh, what other HMIs work with this, uh, this technology? Well, uh, I think you answered it well, that why would you go anywhere else, right? <laughs> <laughs> um, but if somebody were to be stuck with a legacy system of some sort, well, mm -hmm. I guess it, it comes down to the protocols that they would support. So this thing would support things like Modbus, uh, DNP3, uh, MQTT. Um, we, have, we don't have Ethernet IP built in at the moment, but that's under um, in process. And it'll be delivered via the PLC next door and should be coming very shortly. In the meantime, however, we do have gateways that translate between Modbus and Ethernet IP. So we could stick that in the middle and get that into an Ethernet IP environment if they needed to do so. So pretty much that covers most of the big ones. And um, uh, we do OPC UA as well. So okay. if you need to do OPC, then that's another way to do it. And that's Excellent. built right into the hardware itself. And a uh, question, does the Linux system run on a separate CPU? If it hangs, will the PLC side maintain control of a station? The Linux uh, that we're using is called Yocto. And that's one of the uh, distributions, I guess you'd call it, of Linux. And it's kind of purpose built for industrial automation and controls. And then there's also a real-time kernel that is part of that. So the real-time kernel is what's actually operating the PLC. And that is the fundamental base operating, oper operating system for the PLC itself. Right. So that is going to take primacy over all things. It will dole out resources as they're available for other functions, such as communications or visualization and all that kind of stuff, much in a way that uh, in the older days with PC-based control, if you had a real-time operating system, that was the bedrock of the thing. And it would allow Windows resources whenever it wasn't doing a critical task. Um, and it's much the same way here. So all the important uh, control op operations of the PLC, which are time critical, will be handled by this real-time kernel within this distribution of Linux. And then the regular Linux side of it will take care of the less demanding things, the more human interface type of things. And um, it, it even hosts our, um, our software. So if you're gonna program with the IEC 61131, that kind of resides on top of the Linux and allows you to directly interface with the IO and so forth. So um, you know, it's been in use now for several years and we have not found Linux to be a uh, limiting factor or any, in any way, a less reliable or robust, um, way to run the actual controller itself. 
Understood. That's great. So we've got, uh, got another minute or so left. Uh, if anyone has any questions, by the way, uh, in case you haven't heard this, use the little button, uh, Q&A button in the bottom center of your screen. And uh, finally, I'd just like to ask you if, if you're an attendee who is excited about uh, PLC Next and wants to know more about uh, this technology, what do they do? Don? Well, I think it starts with uh, well, it starts with us, the Water Boys. Um, right now, we're we're supplying uh, our uh, PLC Max pump controller via our engineering services team uh, at our corporate headquarters in uh, Harrisburg, Pennsylvania. And what's nice about that is that if you're doing what we have talked about here today, then that's kind of a cookie cutter kind of approach. But also, if you want some customization on that, that's when we have that conversation as well. One of the challenges we've kind of had is there are so many people who would buy a pump controller, and the way they want it delivered is that a complete, you know, packaged solution, you know, pre-wired, ready to go, is that just the hardware, give me the SD card. There's a lot of options in terms of what it is that we deliver to you. So we would ask for that opportunity to have that conversation to decide what's the right, uh, right, the right solution for you, and we can do that very easily through our engineering services team in Harrisburg. So Excellent. D, D. Dickinson at phoenixcontact.com or D. Eifert at phoenixcontact.com. In fact, why don't you put those in the uh, chat session uh, while we yeah. move on to the next thing. And also, I think everyone will be, receive an email that will have everyone's contact information, but it'd be a nice idea to have your, your, uh, your mm -hmm. uh, web address and your email there. Well, once again, thanks to you both. Uh, you guys were great in the virtual trade show presentations we did a few weeks ago. And, uh, and again, uh, knocked it out of the park today. Thanks so much for joining us. Thank you. Thanks to everyone at uh, Trihedral and VT Skata. We appreciate it. Yes, it's our pleasure. Fantastic. Thank you. So I'm gonna snatch back control of the screen. And uh, once again, um, Q and A's anytime. So uh, take this opportunity. We've got a few minutes before we start the next presentation. By a few, I mean maybe two. Uh, by all means, get up, uh, stretch a bit. If you've been around for all of these presentations so far, thank you very much. Uh, take a chance to uh, stretch. If you want to move to one of the other presentations, uh, you simply close this session and then go back to your email uh, where you had the Eventbrite invitation and select another one. Just to let you know what's coming up in the final hour on the three different streams, we've got Travis Smith from, uh, from Census, a Xylem brand, and uh, we've got Mervyn Betts over in the oil and gas stream, and uh, we've got two folks from Schweitzer Engineering Laboratories coming up uh, over in the power. So now is the time to, to, uh, to change streams, get on a different train, and in the meanwhile, I will get my notes prepared. Hi, Travis, are you there? Good morning, good afternoon. Oh, you got your camera going and everything. You're way ahead of me. Thank you, good afternoon to you as well. How's the weather uh, where you are? Where it's are a gorgeous, you? It's a gorgeous day in Raleigh, North Carolina. Ah. Sunny and in the upper 60s. I wish I was outside enjoying it. <laughs> I hear you, it's, not, it's sunny here, but not so warm, sadly, in, in Halifax, Nova Scotia. Um, so just a reminder, if folks, uh, if you're settling at any time, you can, uh, if you have a question for Travis, uh, about what he's talking about, feel free to click the Q and A button in the, uh, the center bottom of the screen and just type it in. And at the end of the presentation, we'll make sure that we answer all those questions. All right. So I'm gonna kick things off here. And uh, again, welcome Travis Smith from Census Xylem Company. Travis is the Senior Director of Water Marketing. Uh, he has over 20 years of experience in the water industry, including uh, water and wastewater treatment, distribution management, process, and design. Uh, many of you will know Census if, you're, uh, if you frequently go to uh, to the trade shows that we're not going to this year, you would often you would see census there, and uh, they offer a wide range uh, of of services and products for the public service providers, from utilities uh, to cities themselves, industrial complexes and campuses, and they they help them do more with their infrastructure to improve the quality of life within those places. And uh, today he's going to talk about the future. Uh, the water utility of the future, which is certainly uh, on everyone's mind right now as we uh, are here in a state of change uh, in so many areas. 
uh, and that is addressing the challenges of data collection, uh, integration, monitoring, analytics, control, and, and possibilities going forward. So once again, uh, thank you, Travis, and I will let you snatch away control of my screen. Like All so. right. Well, thank you very much for for uh, including us today. I um, well, I may have. Chris, do I have the right screen up? You do. Yeah, I can see okay. your uh, presentation. Um, thank you very much for including us today. So we'll be happy to go through a variety of activities. I did think, though, before we really started the water utility of the future, though, I wanted to be remiss if we didn't address the current situation. But I found this quote from John Kennedy, who says the Chinese use two brush strokes to write the word crisis. One brush stroke stands for danger, the other for opportunity. Certainly we want to be aware of the danger, but we want to recognize the opportunity going forward. Uh, I think that that's really pertinent to the current situation. And then I did a little bit of history re reconnaissance there. And what I can say is crisis often provide the political motivation and focus for us to take action that would otherwise be deferred or minimized. And some great examples that you may or may not be aware of. In 1932, there was a huge outbreak of color in New York City that led to the largest infrastructure project in the United States at that time, the Croatan Aqueduct, to bring clean water to New York City. In 1871, the Chicago Fire, which devastated that entire city, caused them to rethink all of their guidelines for water main sizing, velocity, hydrant placement, that became a cornerstone for a lot of municipal design since that time. And in 1969, the, the great fire in Lake Erie was one of the many pollution in, uh, incidents that led to the Clean Water Act. What I think we can see is COVID-19, although providing different stresses to different types of communities in different ways, depending on who they are, but it's certainly gonna change our focus, our planning for the future around resiliency and emergency management there as applicable to those utilities. And this has been probably the greatest stress of a widespread emergency management condition for those water utilities. In the past, they may have been stressed from a weather or natural disaster, and they could rely on another utility. Well, here they're being stressed all at the same time. So certainly a different kind of focus, energy, problems. And I think it will provide some impetus for their design of their future and their future utilities. But we want to take a look through a variety of activities today. Um, so if we, here, I want to address, you know, the future is not going to be easy. The intensity and the number of challenges will continue to increase for those water utilities. The good news is necessities is the great mother of invention. There's going to be introduction of new tools and capabilities. Uh, the future needs a solid foundation to support the structure. You know, how do we embrace utility intelligence going forward? What does that look like? What does it mean? It's not a xylem product. I'm talking about a conceptual design here. Um, so some key drivers that I think are, are going to stress all utilities in the future at different magnitudes of timing, but certainly present. So population, the growth, the shift, the urbanization, of the current world, climate change. I don't want to get into political discussion, but certainly we can see that it's hotter. We have more volatile, higher sea levels, bigger storms. Agriculture, we have more demand for food production, more irrigation. Health, pharmaceuticals, obviously pandemics. The pharmaceuticals also lead to microconstituents through the wastewater water cycle that pass back into the drinking water that cause new concern. Industrialization, complex processes uh, that have impacts, an example be PFAS. Sometimes they crop up years or decades after being in production when we close the cycle between exposure and health hazards. Increase in connectivity between the industrialization of the nation. Energy, there's gonna be more demand for energy than ever before, more innovations. Things like fracking are gonna stress the water industry. There will be more of those to come. Infrastructure, well, it's certainly not getting any younger. There'll be regulations. You see sort of today even focus on lead and copper and some restrictions around those activities. 
more funding constraints, and as talked about in the last hour, potentially an ever burdening security concern. Uh, what we can say is the security of today will not be good enough for the security of tomorrow because they're always continuing to evolve into more per perils of, of opportunity for terrorism, threats, and hacking. Social political concerns, the citizens have access, the smart city strategies, the utilities are under in the United States, constant threat of privatization, and all those things put onto the same world. And in the water cycle, we often can't control the location of the water or even the phase, whether it's in vapor, liquid, or, or ice, but we can control the water quality and the management of how we move that water through the cycle. What those things do mean is, is the impacts on the water utility from all these stresses, increasing demand in the cities, more wastewater, saltwater intrusion on the coastal areas, and a huge percentage of the population, world's population, lives in coastal environments, challenging stormwater management, aquifer depletion, we see that in the Midwest today, increasing complexity of the treatment, particularly when we look at things such as PFAS and microconstituents, more demanding, more informed customers. There's a thirst for data. And now when we move, remove things like face-to-face -face contact, even more uh, imperative that we get data access and connectivity. Higher energy costs, uh, costs less money and more needs for the utilities. Those are a lot of world challenges. We see the impacts today, even on a lot of utilities. So this is four different charts from the AWWA benchmarking study. The utility date debt ratio going up over time. Customer service cost per account going up over time. Potable O&M costs over time going up. Technical complaints all rising. Evidence of, of these things are beginning to crop into our, our daily lives. And this data is even old at 2018. A lot of it is from a 2017 data function as the 2019 benchmark study hasn't even come out. I suspect all of these will be exacerbated and extrapolated up when we look at the future data. They all cause pressure, financial pressure into the water utility and they have to deal with things to create uh, sustainability and you have bursts, non-revenue water, fighting for higher uh, revenue on the rates, water quality issues, emergency management certainly focused today, uh, an aging workforce that is not being replenished, regulatory compliance changes, privatization, security and funding, and the only thing the utilities have to, to balance that oncoming pressure is to get return on investment on their current uh, assets, spending, they have to mitigate their risks, stretch their asset utilization, fight public perception, look for ways to, to make the rate adjustments possible, improve customer service and efficiency. And it's a tough back, act and we're not seeing it sustainable with the current methodologies. The utilities continue to get further and further behind as exhibited by the debt structure on the previous chart. Um, often people say, well, the answer's in the data and the intelligence, but when we take a peek into that data function, you see a bunch of legacy data silos that they're trying to interconnect across each other. You know, most cities have some sort of internal network, an ERP system, a GIS system, work order asset, CIS, meter, meter data management, SCADA, hydraulic modeling, and all these things are trying to be laced together. Some of them are on-premise, some of them are cloud-based different firewalls between them, and each at a different uh, upgrade schedule. Trying to maintain this becomes very, very precarious. Knowing the system of record becomes precarious. Everyone is trying to sell analytics on top of their own system. Uh, all of these things have grown over the last two decades to serve the, the original intended purpose, but as they look to expand beyond there, you get overlap, duplication, conflicts uh, and gaps within your management, your data, and your IT structure is definitely stressed. Uh, typically a water utility uh, is struggling to find um, top talent in the IT and support world in there. They often bring out to service contractors and service providers to help with that. So that gives them some, some use, but their architecture makes it difficult to be sustainable and scalable. 
And then it's further complicated with the problem of, well, are they flooded with data that's useless? Are you capturing just enormous amounts of flow data in the system or some other incremental measurement that is not really useful? Do you have too little data or is the data integrity garbage that all undermine your return on investment within the system? So that kind of paints an ugly tough picture for a water utility. Well, let's look at some of the good news inside of those functions. Um, some great technology coming on to play that we can use to combat those particular activities. So electronics, reduction in costs, iPhones, all those things make all electronics cheaper because of the volume, the semiconductor battery production. We get more edge processing, machine learning, batteries are getting cheaper, longer life. Communications, there's many more platforms of communications and infrastructure and higher bandwidth capabilities. Data storage is cheaper, more accessible, has higher capacity than ever before. The analytics, you have a lot more edge intelligence or artificial intelligence. You, you know, the workforce is becoming more educated in that and just a burgeoning amount of software development people that are able to really kind of crowdsource best of the, the breeds and best practices to be most innovative. Uh, those things all bring water utilities, new, new sensors, new data, give us more transparency, more affordability, more options. Hopefully some more re resources or the ability to reallocate the current resources that are available. Um, so how can we take those things and pair them together? Well, what I see it becomes the focus in the water utility uh, it becomes to create new paradigms, new relationships, and new opportunities. And it looks a little bit like this. The utility must be resilient. And, and I made this slide six months ago, but it even emphasized the point even much more so with the coronavirus. You have to have a multifaceted approach. Redundancy, responsive, diverse skill sets, a deeper understanding of your operations. You have to be sustainable. You have to look beyond just the potable water meter to cash functions or the, the discharge permit. You wanna manage the storm water, the groundwater, the irrigation, the source water, the reuse. Um, you have to become more efficient, more efficient in the transport, the treatment. Even think about things such as time of use. We talk about time of use in the electric industry. Why not the water industry? have to get better at leakage management, data analytics, have to become more transparent. Transparency leads to consumer confidence, credibility, uh, the ability to, to ask for more funding, the ability to get better rate adjustments, provide notifications, be accountable to the citizens. All those things are, are gonna be demanded of a water utility uh, to be effective in the future and they have to do it while managing all the risk and maximizing the safety of the citizens and their employees. So how can we go through that and that's where we want to introduce a little bit of the utility and intelligence concept of data collection integration monitoring analytics the controls and possibilities. Again this is not a, a, a product that we're selling it's a concept that we believe the directions of the water utility of the future. So what does it look like? Well, it's data. It's flexible models for variety, veracity, velocity, and volume, the four V's of data. Integration, related and accessible data, integrated solutions, policies and business practices to support the goals. So it doesn't just stop at the data and the measurement activities associated with um, just the system or something, you have to adapt your employees uh, and your policies around those. It consists of services to fill in uh, resource, human resource gaps, trim the peaks or, or cut costs, afford higher partial skill sets, um, manage those risks and assets. And it has to be holistic. The same water gets pushed around the water cycle Today, we are still drinking the same water that the dinosaurs used millions of years ago. We have to manage it through all facets, facets of the water cycle and all parameters. 
uh, inclusive of the quality and the movement of the water. So if you walked into the water utility on July 1st, 2025, this is what I'd hope you'd see. You'd see dashboards of water production, production, consumption, wastewater, reclaim, your energy chemical usage, flushing management, alarms, active work orders, heat maps of water age, pressure, highs and lows, sewer tank catchment levels, leaks and I and I. Give you your finger on your pulse just as you would it today if you were running a business from a financial standpoint. The utilities can progress to that type of dashboard instant CEO kind of picture snapshot of where they stand today. It would inclusive of trends, alerts, predictive analysis and models, things to allow us to look at what is the impact of things we can't control, weather, trend our own water balance, manage abnormal conditions, find ways to predict problems either through uh, particular volume tracking or maintenance needs, looking at likelihood of failure, cost of failure, so we don't overspend, over repair, or underspend and under repair particular problems. Use models with new highly calibrated information for emergency management, maintenance and ops plannings and sustainability. And here's a huge piece of, of if a model is extracted from one 30 day period in the summer one year, and you're trying to extrapolate that into a two decade design, well, that's a pretty um, distant extrapolation. And you can often overspend or underspend your, your treatment facility, your wastewater treatment, or your distribution collection system just by not having the right or sustainable model going forward. I think it also looks like integrated solutions, virtual reality, give the guys in the field tools. They're integrated to smart water applications, augmented reality right there in the field of what's in there. Integrated with the GIS, the work orders, the asset management, field tools. So you become empowered from the data to the guys in the field taking action because until action is taken, often the benefit is not captured. Then we have to look at activities of are we over or under spending? Are we looking at the likelihood of failure? The cost of failure? Are we trying to balance the preventative replacement versus the reactive repair to get in that optimum point? Think for example, a pipe, a main water main replacement or a force main replacement. You know, you can track things that you can't control, environmental conditions of soil type and temperature, uh, and then you need to measure that with things you can control or, or change, the operational, the transient suppression, and the water quality, uh, but bring in metadata around those things and make sure that they're spending the, the right amount of money in the right place because it's going to be challenged more and more. And take those activities and now turn the data into something that is more usable that you can ride to really capture the return on the investment that you make. The methodology, as I see it, is to bring these things together where you increase the revenue capture. I didn't say raise the rates. I said make sure you get the revenue associated with the water you produce. A lot of that functions around non-revenue water. Mitigate the risk because those costs can escalate quickly. Uh, and if you can manage them to lower them, then you're going to have more sustainable budgets. Enhance your customer service, naturally decrease your cost, optimize your assets. Most water utilities sit on hundreds of millions of dollars worth of assets um, that, would, that would shame any Fortune 500 company on their balance sheet. And they need to manage that from a lifetime uh, supply. And often those particular lifetimes are measured in decades, not years. So getting a little bit more out of those things can really change the financial picture. Uh, and as you begin to balance those things and turn that engine, you're able to support the onslaught of the earlier pressure that we discussed of all of the things that are, that are coming towards the utility. And that methodology looks like simple engineering classic uh, activities of measure, monitor, analyze, improve, and control. And I listed one simple example out here. So we might measure 
things like flow, pressure, level, quality, status, and you see an example of 30 PSI. On the bottom, though, there's some gotchas. So what's the accuracy of that measurement? How latent is it? Uh, you might only begin to monitor for when it has gone awry from that particular baseline. You don't always need to monitor all the data. You might need to monitor the alarms or look at reports, and then they become time stamped. Then if you get enough of that data, you begin to aggregate it, bring in other information, look at trends or models to know is there time to take action. For example, here, if you had a low pressure alarm at a specific location, and then you also added into it, hey, there was a burst a little while away, uh, and it was hydraulically tied to that tank, you begun to understand the impact and where the source of the problem is. Uh, then you begin to actually take action of work orders, policies, uh, and, and actions for repair, burst, and replace that pipe. And eventually, you know, you might be able to get enough intelligence out of it to control the situation where you're, you're using something, uh, a skater rule to manage that pump against the pressure, reduce the pressure in the lines to take that risk out, to manage the system better, to reduce leakage, and, and bring that whole control loop to closure there. Uh, but it certainly first starts with measuring and monitoring, getting enough intelligence to, to improve that and know where to write those control things. And there's progression to be made along each step of the way. And that's what we want to talk about next here. So at the bottom of our staircase here are all the assets. Again, hundreds of millions of dollars worth of things that a water utility owns out there, the tanks, the pipes, the pumps, the hydrants, Lots of, of metal and iron, particular things in the plants. Uh, just, and then there's a, a burgeoning amount of measurement on top of that to know what is happening in those assets, what the status, what the, the, the pressure, the flow, what's going through them, what the energy use for them, water quality. And just beginning to be measuring those things, you could become get better accountability and better management of it. And the next step is, is not to always watch the data, but to monitor the alarms and the abnormal conditions and drag that into the messaging in the field. A lot of utilities have climbed this particular three sets of stairs here uh, for a good chunk of their, their distribution and even collection system. Where they're, they're seeing now, though, is more of the trending. Can you analyze that over time? And then we get to modeling. Can you use hydraulic models or bio wind on the wastewater side, stormwater scenarios? Uh, and then lastly, control to capture that. What, you, what, what I see is there's return on investment from each step as you go forward to help pay for the next step. And you do have to look at the criticality of the nature of what you're trying to do. You don't need to control everything. There are critical things that are, that are right for control that provide great return on investments. Others might stop at monitoring. Others might have value through trending or in the modeling. In most cases, though, the number of services tends to go up as you go up in this staircase. The return on investment can span across each particular one, but the utility impact is often felt as if you impact the lifetime or change the sizing of procurement or operation of the assets because it's such a bigger financial picture. So if we're not tying each step back to the assets, it begins not to be a very affordable action or a good return on investment for the utility. And, and then the data and system needs do tend to increase as we go up that model. And then to make it all happen, you know, they have to have tangible outcomes at each particular thing that if they're not in a control methodology to go to work orders and the GIS and the asset management system. And we put this yellow arrow on here because always there's a concern around accuracy and latency that are driven by the applications. No one system is the most cost effective for all of those problems. There's a variety and several different things to choose from and consider as you try to pick the right system for the right and the right methodology and the right level of sophistication for the application that you're trying to achieve. Um, 
Some other considerations here is if you look at a unified solution, solution between the metrology, the communications, the data, and the analytics and applications, or is all that data integrated? Can you go up and down that stack for alarm settings and work orders and configuration and, and get the data back and forth? Or are they ad hoc solutions where you're passing the data, trying to pull with high latency, support costs, and integration costs? They can impact the decisions, the functionality, and the return as you look to, to multiply the interface points versus bringing them together across the utility. And then, can we simplify the data structure? Those same silos, do they report up to an enterprise level and pull down? So now that you're not managing every system individually, are you recording the system a record here? We're not saying tear down the silos, we're saying right up and cross connect through some sort of enterprise layer. Uh, there's, there's lots of people that in that space there. Um, and then cloud access through those things, I think is the future so that you can access them remotely. You know, we hear today in, in the coronavirus, some of the people are more sophisticated. They've gone to remote systems and smart utility networks. Hey, I can do still do most of my job from home because I can see what's going on in my water distribution network because we have this cloud access to the data. Uh, I think that that's going to become more important. As we alluded to a little earlier, though, some of the things that get people most caught up is trying to use the right tool for the right action and the right, the right measurement, the right communications activity. So I invite you to consider the following. You know, if you were going to measure something and then cut it with an ax, well, you might not choose a micrometer measurement. But if you were gonna cut it with a scalpel, you might. So you have to pair up your application to your measurement. And then if you were gonna transport the information, the three depictions on the right there often depend on the criticality of the, the nature of what you're transporting for speed, uh, latency, um, and security and criticality. If you were moving a rock, well, speed may not be the thing. If you're moving water for a medical crisis, that's a different layer. If you're transporting a human organ, all those things are going to have different pathways, needs, and criticality. It's the same thing with data communications, radio frequency, cellular, ethernet, Wi-Fi. Each one of those different methodologies um, or independent networks can all have pros and cons, and they need to be evaluated for the right application. And we are not here to say that one size fits all. I think that it's actually the opposite, that you, you need to employ a multitude of, of networks, for the right thing for the right job, and converge the data at the other end. So an example of some utilities going forward today that are doing it, uh, this happens to be Walla Walla, Washington. Or, or put out, they have flow, they have water meters at every service connection, just like most utilities, but they dispersed in their pressure monitoring. So all of a sudden they began to add a little bit of data that became very in the operations. And they broke it, they had four pressure zones and they began to monitor and they saw in pressure zone two, the lighter colored red dots indicate a lower pressure that looked to be abnormal certainly indicative of probably some chronic leakage in there. Uh, they, were, they used that sort of coarse measurement as a, as a cost-effective way to identify where to bring in more sophisticated sensors in situ devices and acoustic monitoring so to locate, and they didn't apply these more expensive solutions across the entire network. So you want to stack your data needs in layers of sophistication and cost and complexity to use the right tool for the right job. The next component would be looking at services. So often utilities try to do all of the actions themselves, but there's a multitude of assistance out there. And I think in the future you see you'll have services on an operational standpoint, assets as a service. So today we frequently hear about software as a service um, and, and, but I think there's going to be a future where there's pumping and water as a service. Uh, there'll be more activities of that. 
analytics as a service, in situ surveys have already been a service designed or out there. Because what can happen is on the graph on the right there, many things apply to a water utility at the same time. And if they stack up, they can quickly become understaffed. And if they ramp up to that staffing, it's hard for the municipalities to change staffing levels over time and they get saddled with overstaffing after those, those work or projects have phased out or drawn to completion. Um, so there might be a way to level those curves and strategize in the middle by looking at utilizing services throughout their utility or when appropriate for the functions they need. As, as we look at it, the, the next piece is to, to also include not just, we talked a lot about the utility operations, those are things you customer engagement, work orders, analytics, data, communications, measurement, and physical assets. But you have to also manage your policy and your business practices and your assets and your human resources to be in sync with those activities. If you're changing to a very sophisticated uh, data analytics model and your staff is not educated or trained in how to handle that, you're not going to be successful. If you're changing your technology for remote shutoff, but you didn't change your business practices and your policies for over the air shutoff or security, it's not going to deliver the return on investment. So you must adapt policy, practices, and human resources to meet the technology. The next is you can't do them in isolation. So we use this graph regularly to look at, at five things in a water utility that are the makeup of the water utility. The transport of water, which they can highly control, the ecosystem, which they cannot control that it must react to, the treatment of the water, which is highly regulated, the operations, which is a lot of, often a lot of the cost um, and of the variable cost, and then the assets, which are actually a lot of the long-term cost. Um, Changing the asset equation what is well investment. But when you tug on any one particular aspect of the wheel between transport ecosystems, operations, or treatment, it impacts the other like a spider web. So if you change the leakage pattern within a utility, you fix a leak. Well, the leak was actually a flushing device. Now you have to account for the water quality in the same area to make sure you're balancing out leaking out was flushing that particular water main, they can't be done in isolation. Um, likewise, if you change the flushing patterns, you change the, the water age and the transport on the, uh, or the, the pressure that could impact the transport and the operations and affect the, the assets. You must look at all facets together. If you overmanage just one particular thing like leaks, you will see a new problem in a new area and it will cripple your return on investment. The other thing again is, is you want to accomplish the entire water cycle across it's the same water from beginning to end just pushed around and cleaned and the challenge is, is in that cleanliness and delivery. You want to actively monitor, effectively analyze, proactively plan and dynam dynamically optimize all of it um, throughout the entire water cycle. When doing these types of things you can lead yourselves from what today was a very vicious cycle of rate pressure, cost risings, maintenance budget cuts, leading to more repair costs, lower public perception, can't change the rates. You just get caught in this debt cycle that can't get out. When we begin to break those things with utility intelligence, we can climb into a more virtuous cycle, excuse me, we actually improve operational efficiencies. Now you can get a little more maintenance, lower your repair costs, increase your investment in the tools and staffs, increase your revenues, and begin to become sustainable and affordable across the utilities. Um, certainly not an easy task to get from here to there. And people ask me, well, that, that was great. What, what can I do? And I'll tell you right now, I have two teenage sons, and, and every day it's a challenge to motivate them. And they hear me ask the same question of them every day, whether it's scholastically or athletically or, or for their own learning or what, what are you going to get, what are you going to do to get better today? 
don't, don't tell me tomorrow, next week, or I'm working on it. I want to know what you're going to do to get better today. And I don't often care what a, the answer is. I, I want to hear that they're trying to do something better today. So I came up with six action items that any water utility could take home from them today and begin their journey. Again, it's not a destination, it's a journey. It will, it will never end of climbing the continuous improvement ladder, but you have to start somewhere. So here are the suggestions that I, I have. Include your strategic plan, data, infrastructure, and systems at scale. Look at two-way, com, multiple comm solutions. Don't look at a singular system. Don't look at a one-way system. If you're looking at a one-way system, you're behind the times. If you can't communicate back into the device in the field, the artificial intelligence that you're embedding or paying for in that device is going to be useless. Outline the plans for consumption, hydraulics, water quality, again, working on policies and HR plans to accomplish these goals. Look at things like non-revenue water meter accuracy, pressure monitoring, water age, meter testing. The reason meter testing and meter accuracy are on there is they're such financial drivers to the water utility. Often they're, they're saddled with old meters that are running at 90% accuracy that a little investment can really change the financial picture and it's all straight to the bottom line quickly. Review your data and integration plans. What do you set up on your MDM, your CIS, enterprise layer, your work order, your asset management, GIS system, SCADA system, all of those things. Begin the, to, to make sure that you have a plan and understand that plan and look sure it's scalable. Ask yourself every purchase, what is my return on investment? Because if you're, if you're not making wise investments to get that particular return, get strapped in the cash flow, if you make good investments, you'll be affordable to get the next one to self-fund your, your activities going forward. Challenge your suppliers, challenge your engineers, compete, drive, force them to answer the questions. Look at life cycle costs. Don't look at them strictly on a payback period, but look at the total return on investments over the anticipated life cycle of those assets. Review some service models. Get a quote for services. Work with procurement for new models. Stress, challenge that. See where it fits for your utilities. Every utility's cost structure and needs are a little different, but begin to explore that to understand to set yourself up for the future. And get the right data at the right interval for the, the actions. You know, measuring one minute flow data at a residential house, that's for academic institutions, not for operations and finance and, and practicalities of solutions that's not sustainable. Your comm solutions won't make it. Your assets are going to die. Make sure that if you're, you know, you're going to measure it in the right intervals and at the right precision to achieve your accomplishments, tie that into your procurement, tie it into where you're going in the future. You may be billing in thousands of gallons, but you may be trying to chase leaks down at the one gallon per minute. So if you're not measuring closer to that smaller increment, you're not going to find the leaks. So those are actions that you can take right now. And I think that that covers uh, most of my section. Chris, I'll, I'll open it up for questions um, and answers from the, the group there. Thanks, Travis. That was great. You covered, uh, you covered a lot of territory and, uh, and introduced a lot of really important ideas that I think a lot of people are struggling with right now. Um, so while we're uh, looking at our webcams here, uh, I'll just remind you again, if you have any questions for Travis uh, or, or, or myself, uh, just use the Q&A button in the bottom center of your screen and type it in there and we'll get right to it. Uh, but first, I, what, one thing that I was thinking about as you came to the end, I kept thinking, I, I know there are a lot of uh, people out there who are partway between the, the, the vicious cycle and the virtuous cycle uh, who are looking at these slides and going, yes, yes, that's, ah, yes, I, I know I'm, I'm on this path. And others who are perhaps... Uh, closer to the vicious cycle who are hyperventilating into brown paper bags. Uh, what would you say to some of those people, some of those water or superintendents who are, who have inherited aging systems uh, 
you know, where, where do you start? And in, in, in even that list you gave us at the end of, of what to do to get better today, what would you say is the most important thing to do to somebody who is really at the beginning of this process? Sure. Well, you make a great point. Every utility is at a different point in their journey, either from um, the assets they have, the sophistication that they have, the data that they have, and, and it's their own journey. It's not my journey or um, right. the things. So they're in control of it. Uh, what we found is, is something very, very simple and, and it's actionable and it has huge impact. So most utilities have between four to 10% of their, their service connections are what's called C and I meters, commercial and industrial meters. But those four to 10% of their meter population represent 35 to 65% of the volume that comes through their system. And so investing in the accuracy of those units because all the revenue that comes in is proportional to the flow outlay and making sure that the accuracy of that displacement consumption is as tight as it can be um, often is some great windfalls to the utilities there and begins to break that cycle. And now they can look to some cost savings beyond there. Another great low capital way. I mean, extremely low capital investment way is mine your billing records versus your, your meter read records. We see time after time when people do entire uh, change outs from a direct read or a drive-by system to an AMI or direct read to a drive-by system, they find a number amount of dormant accounts, things that were shut off and never turned back on and people weren't paying their bills and the citizens typically aren't going to sign up and just say, hey, me. So a little bit of, of data mining can really provide some, some windfalls in that revenue cycle. And certainly revenue is a great way to get things to avoid, to afford some investment to start capturing the cost savings that, that keep the engine running for a longer period of time. That's great. That's a great answer. Um, so you've been very careful in your presentation, I think, to, to keep it very uh, generic uh, in terms of advice that, that people can, can really work with. But I'd like, I'd like to invite you to talk to a little bit more about what you do at Census and how you help people engage in this process. Sure. So Census, we're focused on su supplying a different or multifacets portions of the solution. So we have 10 metrology lines that measure the, the consumption flow of, of water. We're adding with the Xylem family a multitude of additional water quality sensors and hydraulic sensors around there that begin the data collection exercise. The second tier is the communication. So um, census itself was network. Uh, most people don't realize we have an entire cellular division, uh, powered and battery things. So we began to bring in the right communications infrastructure uh, for the application. The next layer is around data hosting and management. So um, we found that most water utilities weren't able to, to house and store and access and, and make that data secure. Uh, they didn't have the infrastructure and the IT around that and the, the volume of data that comes from a, an AMI system, much like a SCADA system, is huge and enormous and a big undertaking for them. And because that data is not centrally located at a water plant, but coming from thousands of locations, that became very overwhelming. So we took that on as a service, as an option of the utility. And the fourth level is, is to build applications to make all that data more useful. Data is interesting, but the actions are useful. Uh, we can't take the actions where we're, we're, we don't always drive and, the, and operate the shovels and turn the valves that make the water utility run, but hopefully we can point them to when and where and, and the impact of doing such to make it easier for them, make that information at their fingertips and actionable from that side going forward. So they can get the benefit of the relationship of all those things from measurement, communications, data hosting, and analytics into their utility. Uh, and, and that's what we're focused on. Xylem as a whole, 
has lots of other things in addition beyond census around process treatment, water quality, wastewater, drinking water, um, dewatering and stormwater management that supplement all those things because it's the same water, the same communications infrastructure and data repositories can be expanded beyond just that potable water classical meter to cash application. But a great question. And I think that's pretty much it. I will uh, just take back the screen here and there you are again. Uh, so I think that's all the questions I have. We've got a few seconds left if, uh, if anyone would like to uh, enter one more question. Otherwise, uh, Travis, thank you very much. You've, uh, you've really gone deep uh, on this subject and I really enjoyed listening to your presentation. Thanks for joining us today. Thanks and thank you for having me and I appreciate the time to chat with everybody. Great, thanks Travis. So uh, thank you to everybody. Uh, this has been uh, three hours for some of you. Oh, we've already covered that. That's Pete Diffley, the producer of this event. Uh, thank you on behalf of our whole team here at Trihedral. It was our pleasure to, uh, to put this together and actually listen to all these, these uh, very interesting experts. 